If you like the story you can support the author on Patreon link is in the description. Chapter 1, Prologue I'm very angry about how I died. I wasn't run over by a truck like the other transmigrators, nor was I struck by lightning or lost consciousness while filling out a mysterious online survey. Damn, that would have been a luxury compared to what happened to me. My death was the result of a prank by a wicked woman who enjoys entertaining her millions of followers live. How wicked was she? So wicked that she gave cream cookies to a homeless person to satisfy his hunger, but secretly replaced the cream inside with toothpaste. So wicked that she made a video of the hopeful reactions of animals in a shelter, making them believe they were about to be adopted, only to leave while mercilessly mocking them. So wicked that when she saw a six-year-old blind girl begging, she threw a bottle cap so that the girl would think it was a coin and accepted the girl's grateful gesture with an arrogant face while suppressing her laughter. People like her and her followers show just how messed up society is. She was undoubtedly one of the worst kinds of human scum at all levels, and I was extremely unhappy to die because of her. Is there anything worse than that? Yes, that your transmigration along with the wishes you made after dying goes wrong due to a bureaucratic error. I asked to go to a peaceful world where people like her didn't exist and for some simple skills to make a living without drawing too much attention. Maybe I would have a second life that many would consider mediocre, but it would be a relaxed and happy life. But when I woke up, I realized that everything was wrong. My body wasn't a younger version of myself. My skills weren't the ones I asked for. And more importantly, the world where I ended up was anything but peaceful. Chapter 2, Compensation I want to go to the world I requested. Not possible, please request something different. Shortly after waking up, a semi-transparent screen appeared in front of me, explaining that it had gone wrong and offering the possibility to request some compensations. I've requested six things so far, and all of them have been rejected. I don't feel any sincerity from your side, you know. The requests you've made are not possible to carry out once the transmigration process has completed. We appreciate your understanding. Please request something different. Okay, let's start with something simple, I concluded that easy solutions were not within my reach and tried to accept the situation. Whose body am I in? Give me their information. Or is that not possible either? From the strands of hair I plucked, I knew that I was now blonde, my skin was so pale and smooth that if it weren't for what hung between my legs, I would have thought I was a woman. I had a fairly defined physique but without large muscles. My arms were longer than I was used to and I had gold bracelets on my ankles and wrists, along with some gold rings on my toe fingers. But the most ridiculous part was that I only had white orange pants with me, and my earlobes were so long that they reached my upper abdomen. Request valid. The body you currently possess is that of a character from the One Piece anime series known as Enel. The body possesses the abilities of the devil fruit eaten by the character, but without the associated weaknesses or drums on the back. Why do I have this body instead of a younger version of myself? as I requested. A different transmigrator requested this body, and due to a bureaucratic error, you got this body while he got yours. The same happened with the swapped world, only it was someone else. Why did he remove the drums? According to the record, he commented that it would be uncomfortable to have them when going to sleep, taking a shower, or engaging in personal activities. Well, he had a point, I nodded, considering that they would have indeed been bothersome to have. So. What is the world I ended up in? I only see trees, fog, and snow. Is it the world of Kimetsu no Yaiba? Some of the demon abilities are insane. Negative, it's the world of Naruto. You are currently in the land of water. Why am I not feeling cold? You are unconsciously using the power of this body to generate enough heat to make the weather not bother you. Alright, let's summarize, I asked to go to a peaceful world and for some simple abilities, but I ended up in a world that considers training young children as killers while I possess a body with the abilities of a logia fruit, but I can swim if I want. Yes. Have I missed any important details I should know? You still have an additional margin to request compensation. I see. Can you provide me with any reference limits? You cannot request anything that overrides the laws of this universe, only smaller things. You also cannot request something like a system, as it should have been included in your body, and now it's not possible. Do I have a time limit? You have 23 hours to decide. I lay down under a tree while looking at the sky and the passing clouds. It's better to reflect a bit and calm down. By the way, how old am I in this body? Enel was 37 years old, but due to the request of the other transmigrator, the age of this body is a decade younger while retaining the strength. 
therefore, you are currently 27 years old. You might also be interested to know that your height has grown to 266 centimeters. What is the average height of an adult in this world? 180 centimeters. Wow, I'm enormous compared to that. I exclaimed in surprise. When I talk to people, they'll barely reach my chest, and they'll have to look up to meet my eyes. I can forget about being discreet, even if I cover myself like the Akatsuki members, I'll stand out like a sore thumb. I sighed as I ran my hand through my face. I could think of several people who would be delighted to study or modify my new body just because of this fact. Should I start as Tony Akimichi? I considered for a moment, recalling one of my favorite fanfics, but I discarded it just as quickly. Forget it. This body is too old, and I don't want to join any of the ninja villages, I never liked taking orders from anyone. But even an organization like Akatsuki had a base, I couldn't just live in the wilderness. It would surely lead to too many problems in the long run, and there would likely be spies in the villages who would report on me. Where could I settle without being bothered? The clouds are so beautiful. Hey, can I get a sky island? Something like Weatheria or Skypiea. Suddenly, I remembered the hidden village where the Shandia warriors had taken refuge. If they could bring a one-piece physique and power, bringing a sky island shouldn't be difficult, right? He wouldn't have trouble going up and down the island, while the number of ninjas who can fly in this world is close to zero, let alone at the 10,000 meter altitude that it usually is. I might even be able to establish my own hidden village. One that's truly hidden, unlike the others. Request valid. Please provide the details. I didn't respond immediately, if this is going to be my foundation in this chaotic world, I better think it through. I need to furnish the place, so I need to be able to produce cloud furniture to make it comfortable and maybe sell some to make money. I'll also need some land so I don't have to depend on the outside. How about adding a plot of Torico's vegetable sky? That sounds pretty good. And apple trees, for some strange reason, I've been craving apples since I woke up. I also have to think about what I want to do after having my own place. I always thought that the scientists and doctors in this world were undervalued, I could become a researcher. Then I'll need some facilities, A and D. Three hours later, I gave a list of everything I wanted the Sky Island to have. Its dimensions, facilities, ecosystem, etc. Request approved. The requested Sky Island will be delivered in two days. Compensation covered by 80%. Dot. I suppose it's understandable, I'm asking for something customized after all, I nodded without being anxious about the brief waiting period. Can I request knowledge and talent for research? Request valid. Please provide examples. I fell silent again, trying to think of everyone I could while writing their names with my finger in the snow to not forget them. Surprise challenge. Identify the series and character. Hawkback members of Mad Tsunade Mayuri Kuratsuka Kisukura Harris Shao Tucker Winry Rock Bell Kabuto Ernesti Eshvalier Bulmasenko Ishigami Enel Dr. Frankenstein Orochimaru Akaji Ritsuko Ai Habara. There you go, I said as I pointed to the list, which had grown to the size of a football field. I made sure to highlight three specific fields, biology, souls, and machinery. With these knowledge along with the sum of all their talents and intuitions as researchers, Orochimaru will be like a child who thinks he's a scientist for knowing how to make a vinegar volcano compared to me. I also included the knowledge that Enel should have about meteorology, mechanics, and the development of his devil fruit. Maybe I can make a smaller version of the gold ship. Request approved. Due to the large volume of information, it will be delivered in batches during the nights while you sleep to avoid overloading the brain and give it time to digest, memorize, and reorganize everything. Estimated time, 3 months. Compensation covered by 97% dot. Should I ask for more devil fruits? Nah, that wouldn't be smart. With the knowledge I'll get, I can make smile if I want, and some decent devil fruits with Vegapunk's research. As he said, with enough time and resources, it's not a problem. Oh, I've got it. Chapter 3, Golden Apples Setting aside the more common techniques, the world of Naruto had a mix of strange techniques like Haydn's Curse, the Uzumaki Sealing Jutsu, the Kurama Clan's Genjutsu, the Artifacts of the Sage of the Six Paths, or the Rinnegan. These were potential threats to his carefree lifestyle, and not knowing how they would affect him, he wasn't willing to risk it, so he requested not to be affected by such things, consuming another 2%. Sure, the possibility of Haydn getting a drop of his blood was impossible with his elemental body, but he saw no reason not to ensure the matter. 
what if there was another type of curse that used a portrait of him as a medium instead of blood? In this world, a little paranoia can help you stay alive for a long time. From the moment he accepted that he was in the world of Naruto, he knew he needed to change his mindset or he would end up like Yahiko. It's not like it was an excuse to start exterminating villages and drinking human blood, but he needed to take a more adaptable approach, in the vein of Orochimaru. He knew some characters and their stories, but it's not like he had friendships with them or anything. Just go with the flow, explore as you wish, save when you feel like it, and kill when you are threatened. And whoever asked for Enel's body forgot to request the full hacky package and instead requested that the consumption of physical strength using the power of the devil fruit be reduced to zero. So, apart from a devil fruit ability with no weakness that also wouldn't tire him, he only possessed the mantra ability, which made him the equivalent of a sensor ninja. He didn't even have a golden staff with him. He had some means to defend himself, a place to live, and a new world to explore, but he felt like something was still missing, and with only 1% of compensation remaining, he could only ask for something small. So, he asked for apples. The power to summon the most delicious apples from the world whenever he pleased. Well, it seems that thinking about Tony Akimichi influenced him a bit. But it turns out that this was so simple that it wasn't enough to consume the remaining 1%, so he raised the requirements a bit. Then I want golden apples. In countless myths and legends, these apples had similar characteristics in common, they could cure ailments and diseases while increasing one's lifespan. There were also variants that granted forbidden knowledge, increased fertility, enhanced beauty, bestowed immense physical strength upon the consumer, and more. They were so famous that they were even used in some video games. But he went from falling short to going overboard, so after some back and forth, he settled for two types of apples. The most delicious apples could be of different types, depending on whether he wanted a sweeter, more sour, juicier, or crunchier apple. They were also perfect for making juice, jam, pie, or ice cream. Meanwhile, the golden apples retained only the two most well-known effects, which were healing and extending one's lifespan by a year per consumed apple. They were essentially the ultimate panacea. Poison, cancer, congenital defects, blindness, and anything else one could think of would be healed by eating a golden apple. At the same time, not only would the consumer's lifespan increase by a year, but they would also have a rejuvenated body, kept at its prime. Of course, he made sure to request that these were delicious as well. Compensation completed. As a final service, you will receive assistance in obtaining answers in case of important doubts. Thank you for your understanding, and enjoy your new life. Silence. All right, I have two days until I receive my Sky Island, so I think I can take a walk and see the surroundings. I don't even know what time period I'm in. Hmm, should I use my old name, come up with a new one, or use Enel's? I got up and looked around, then began walking in a random direction before feeling something strange in my pants. I held up my waist and looked down. Well, I think I know half the reason why Enel thought he was a god. And here I thought earlobes were exaggerated. Congratulations to my future wife. Wait, I think in this world polygamy is common if you have the ability, right? No matter, let's take things slow. I get lost in my thoughts as I walk and tread on the snow. It's a strange feeling, I can feel how cold it is, but after walking a few minutes, I don't feel like my feet are cold. Not only that, every time I step on a sharp rock or a splintered stick, it just tickles. I'll have to get used to my new body for a while, as the legs are not the same as I had before, and I cover more distance with the same steps. Would people be scared when they see me now? I mean, with how big I am, along with the fact that I'm only wearing pants in this weather, I think I'd give anyone quite a shock. Wait a moment, I suddenly thought of a possible oversight. In this place, they speak Japanese. Do I know how to speak Japanese now? It would be terribly tedious if the first thing I had to do in my new life was find someone willing to teach me an entirely new language, spoken, read, and written. Oh, I see a cabin beyond the trees, let's take a look and find out. Am I talking to myself too often? I don't know if it's because of my new mindset or if it's also a remnant of Enel. I never liked my previous name, and I'm not good at coming up with new ones, so I'll just take Enel's name from now on, he decided as he walked towards the cabin. I see several people entering it. Perhaps it's a hunter's cabin where they rest? I saw some white rabbits, but I have no intention of hunting them. Gutting them, cleaning them, and roasting them is too much work, and if I use my abilities, I don't even know if there will be ashes left, as I don't have good control yet. 
If I get hungry, I can summon an apple. Nuuu. At. I think I heard a child's scream, but what is happening before my eyes is also worth paying attention to. The entire cabin is suddenly impaled with ice spikes as tall as me. I see the shadow of a child who seems stunned coming out of the place. What exactly happened? Chapter 4, I'm Dead? I watched as the boy walked unsteadily, as if he had run out of strength, forcing himself to take one step after another in the snow until he fell headfirst into the cold white cushion, most likely unconscious. Unless he suddenly felt like making a snow angel. My first day, and I've already found something interesting, I muttered to myself as I approached to check on the boy. I'm not an expert in anything yet, but checking for a pulse or breathing is something even a fool knows to do. It looks like he's in shock and he's too thin, I concluded after examining his arms. I don't know if it's his constitution or malnutrition. The most important thing now is to get him to a dry and warm place, or he'll end up dead from hypothermia. He wasn't dressed warmly at all, just brown linen pants and a dark blue shirt. I glanced at the cabin for a moment but shook my head. It seemed like the boy had gone through something unpleasant there and must have unconsciously used some ninjutsu to protect himself. I could melt the ice, but if he woke up there, who knows how he'd react. Taking the boy and placing him on my shoulders, I shot a lightning bolt with the intention of setting the house on fire, but it seems I held back too much, and due to the low temperature and the wet wood from the snow, the cabin didn't ignite. How convenient, I was worried about not practicing my powers, and now I have a perfect target. A few minutes later, I walked away satisfied as the cabin burned without any problems, melting the ice inside and erasing any evidence or bodies that might have been there. Could I have stayed longer? Of course. But the boy on my shoulder is cold, and we really need to find shelter. After walking a bit, I saw a pile of fallen trees in an inverted V-shape, forming a perfect natural shelter to shield us from the wind and snow. I pulled some branches from the surroundings that were dry enough and made a fire at the entrance so that the smoke wouldn't bother us. I didn't even need tinder, an intense spark was enough. I left the boy close enough to the fire for his temperature to recover and sat down, waiting for him to wake up while I gazed at the fire. For some reason, I thought for a moment that I was camping, and an idea struck me, roasted apples. I got up and this time looked for straight, damp branches that could be exposed to the fire without catching fire. I would use them to skewer some apples and take advantage of the fire to cook them. I figured the boy would be hungry once he woke up, and I hadn't eaten since I woke up. It's interesting how the apples appear in my hands, it's like, blink and you'll miss it. I can pretend to put my hand behind my back and pull out the apple as if it were a children's cartoon. It's not logical, but it's fun. It had been about an hour since the boy had passed out, I think. I mean, I don't have a watch with me, and if I look at the sky, I won't be able to determine the time. Maybe tomorrow I can, but not today. In any case, it's getting dark because everything is darkening. MMM. Oh, the boy is waking up. What will his reaction be when he sees me? I mean, I'm barely knee high to him. I watch as his eyelids move, and he slowly opens his eyes. Yes, he looks bewildered, I guess he's wondering why he doesn't feel cold and the not-so-subtle movements of his nose tell me he's noticed the scent of the roasted apples. He straightens up, looking at the fire and the apples. I can almost see question marks forming over his head, adorable. Are you hungry? I ask him. He startles like a rabbit and looks in my direction with panic and evident fear. But he remains stunned and raises his head almost to a 45-degree angle. Do you like roasted apples? I'm sitting with my legs crossed at the entrance to give him more space, and I stretch out my now long arm, taking one of the apples skewered on a stick and offering it to him. Meanwhile, I take another and take a bite. Careful, they're hot, I remind him, but he continues to stare at me without moving, with those big eyes of his. I continue to bite into my apple after dipping it in virgin snow for a moment while I wait. In the end, his stomach growls, and he blushes, taking the apple on the stick and starting to eat it like, a squirrel. A bunch of small bites that puff up his cheeks as his eyes light up. That's right, these are the best apples in the world, enjoy them, I can't help but feel a little proud. The boy nods, and before I know it, he has finished the apple and gazes longingly at the others that are cooking. With a gesture, I invite him to take as many as he wants. It's not like I'm going to run out of apples. Am I dead? He suddenly asks after finishing his third roasted apple. Wow. I didn't expect him to ask that of all things. Why do you think you're dead? 
I ask him with genuine curiosity. Does he see me as some kind of demon? Because I passed out in the snow, and now I woke up in a warm place with delicious food, and I've never seen anyone so tall and covered in so much gold. Are you a god? Ugh. I think I'm about to vomit sugar. Am I going to a bad place for what I did? He asks, tears forming in his eyes. Will I be able to see mom and apologize? I, I didn't want to, but dad was going to. Wow, this took an unexpectedly dark turn. It's almost like... Wait a second. What's your name? Suddenly, a character popped into my mind. He wipes away the tears with the back of his hand, but they don't stop. The image is simply heartbreaking, and it hurts to see him like this. M. My name is Haku, Mr. God, he replies with a trembling voice. Holy shit, I already suspected that this whole story was becoming familiar to me. Ice release, a solitary boy. I'm not a god, Haku, and you're not dead. Chapter 5, Different Tears I I am not. Haku looked at me wide-eyed in complete bewilderment. You're still alive and so am I, so I can't be a god, right? I tried to use logic for children I'm only a little taller and I come from a very far place, maybe that's why you never saw people like me before. Haku nods, but the look on his face tells me he's completely lost as he turns to look at the fire. However, he raised his finger to give drama and quickly caught his attention it is true that my apples are the best in the world, I can assure you that. Haku suddenly starts laughing, it's not an innocent laugh, more of a laugh to release his emotions because tears are still running down his cheeks as he laughs. Do you have room for dessert? Yet. Yeah. Haku brightened at the mention of dessert. All right. I managed to make him relax a bit. Just a few hours ago, he had seen his father kill his mother and had intended to do the same to him, so I can't let him suppress his emotions, or he'll have real problems later on. I perform a sleight of hand and produce two golden apples. I'm a bit worried that he might have some internal injuries or something I didn't see, so I'll make him eat one to ensure he becomes healthy. It's not like it has any effect on chakra or anything, so it should be fine. Haku looks at the golden apples in surprise before looking at me and then back at the apples in my hands. Don't think they're painted, go ahead and take a look, I tell him as I hand one to him, and he actually scratches the skin with his nail, verifying that it's genuinely real. These are very special apples, and very few have the privilege of eating them. I see Haku suddenly becoming anxious. Is he worried that I'm giving him something valuable? Apples are meant to be eaten, I take a bite of my golden apple, intrigued because it's also my first time trying it. The taste is, incredible, like a hundred times better than any other apple I could produce. It makes sense, I suppose, whatever powers or additional effects it has must magically enhance its flavor or something. At the same time, I'm glad I didn't eat the golden apple in the world of Shokyuchiki no Soma. The reaction would have been quite inappropriate considering I still have only pants and some jewelry with me. I feel a warm sensation flow through my body, like soaking in hot springs. I used to think it was nonsense when I read fanfics, but experiencing it is an entirely new feeling. I can almost see the stars shining in Haku's eyes as his pale face turns even redder, and he releases some kind of cold air through his pores. Maybe not receiving proper training for his bloodline has caused some negative effects on his body? As he begins to form some ice around him, he looks at me in fear again, afraid of how I might react once I discover the secret that led his family to ruin without understanding why. Great, you're just like me. I think the best way to make him truly relax is to show him that he's not the only one who can do special things, as he might believe due to his mother's scolding the first time he discovered his ice release. Eh. My response is clearly outside his expectations because he looks at me like a puppy that doesn't understand what's happening around him. Can you use ice? Then you can make some amazing apple ice cream, I nod seriously while crossing my arms. Are you a ninja? No. I don't have a headband. He thinks ninjas are the ones with headbands, which is not entirely wrong, but he definitely lacks a broader view of the world. Maybe that's why the cabin is so isolated in the middle of the forest, his mother must have been the one with the idea of living apart. Can you do things too? Haku stops looking at me with fear and replaces it with curiosity. My ability is different, I raise my hands and make some small sparks jump between them. It's much harder to control. I'm not lying. Ninjas have clear training regimens to strengthen whatever they want. On my part, I rely more on creativity and knowledge. It's beautiful. Thank you, eyes can be very beautiful too. And suddenly, we fall silent. 
I don't know how the conversation has stalled, but I suppose it's partly because he's just getting to know me, and it feels weird to interact with a character from a series. What do you want to do now? I ask after a while. Haku suddenly remembers that he's homeless and parentless. He doesn't know what to do, and like any child, the first thing he does unconsciously is look at the nearest adult for help with his gaze. If you want, you can come with me, I offer sincerely. In two days, I'll have a special house, and I'll feel very lonely if there's no one else. But. I might hurt you. Unlike when Zabuza found him, Haku's will has not been worn down yet, and he worries about losing control of his gift again. If that's what you're worried about, I'll show you something, but don't be scared, okay? Haku seems relieved that I haven't immediately abandoned him and nods. I take one of the branches I used to roast the apples and jab it into the palm of my hand. Ah. Haku covers his face, thinking he's about to see blood. Don't be scared, look carefully, and you'll see I'm not hurt, my tone is a bit rough, but it's the quickest way to dispel his doubts. Haku slowly separates the fingers covering his eyes and witnesses that indeed, there's no blood flowing from the wound. Under his astonished gaze, I remove the branch, and the spot I pierced remains intact. Do you see? I bring my hand closer so he can get a better look. Even if I'm asleep, you won't be able to hurt me. Haku approaches and touches my hand with his small hands, searching for the wound that should be there, but for some strange reason, it's not. Then begins a session of looking at my hand and looking at my face, then looking at my hand again and repeating. I don't know how many times he did it, but my neck hurt just from watching him. Would you really let me go with you? Oh, the tears have returned. Well, at least this time they're not tears of sadness. Chapter 6, Meat or Fish It took a while to fully calm down Haku, who ended up crying himself to sleep, but his hand remained tightly gripping the fabric of my pants, refusing to let go. Perhaps he thought I would leave while he slept? I didn't even introduce myself, how rude of me. My name is Enel. You know, it feels strange to use Enel even though it's the original version, because I grew up watching the series with Enru as the character's name. Mr. Enel. Well then, do you happen to know where the nearest village is? Haku shook his head. Really? It seems like his mother never took him far from their home. I understand his fear and reason for staying close but come on. All right, wait a moment and keep quiet, okay? I had no choice but to try using mantra for the first time, otherwise, we might wander aimlessly for hours, and after a sleepless night, I was feeling a bit impatient. Note aside, the physics in one piece are quite ridiculous. Anyone in my situation would be falling asleep, but my condition is still pretty good, and it only slightly affected my mood. Let's get some meat to eat, I'm in the mood for some barbecue after staring at snow all night. Now, how do I use this? Enel used mantra in combination with his devil fruit ability, so let's try that. Oh, it works. I can sense some kind of response, like a radar. It's quite vague since I'm not used to it, but I think it will work if we head towards where there are more signals, which should be a village or a pack of wolves. Let's go, I grabbed Haku's shirt collar, like picking up a kitten by its neck, and hoisted him onto my shoulders. Even though I know he has extra cold resistance due to his bloodline, I still don't like the idea of him walking the whole way to the village barefoot like me. Stepping on something sharp would be problematic. Wow I'm so high up. Haku used one arm to hold onto my forehead and the other to shield his eyes. I think that's a good idea, I read something about too much light reflected by the snow can damage your eyes, so some villages in snowy areas use a type of glasses with slits. Fifteen minutes later. Well, logically. No matter how isolated Haku's mother wanted to be, it was to be expected that they weren't too far from the village to get supplies or where her husband was working. People are looking at me like I'm a circus act, but if I don't get used to it, it will affect my mood every time I go out. It seems my appearance is a bit intimidating, but at the same time, they don't see me as a threat because Haku is laughing on my shoulders. It wasn't difficult to make some traits when they tasted my apples, although the woman running the local fruit stand has been giving me dirty looks. I got shoes and a couple of sets of new clothes suitable for Haku in dark blue, a couple of backpacks to carry our things, I don't have the legendary inventory, after all, and my pants don't have pockets. I got familiar with the prices while acquiring some Ryo, the currency of this world, and bought some essential items. Like toilet paper, toothbrushes, and soap. Being in a different world is no excuse to neglect personal hygiene. Meat is priced through the roof, 
and my apple barter has limited effectiveness after visiting so many places. So, in the end, I had to settle for grilled fish, which is much more affordable, considering that a significant part of this country's diet comes from fishing. Plus, the seas here aren't as polluted as in my previous world, and the fish taste quite good. I ate five fish without even realizing it. And for dessert, an apple. Also, it seems the man running the butcher shop is the husband of the woman from the fruit stand, and I'm sure that if I bought meat after the way she has been looking at me, she would sell me nearly spoiled meat. Call it a hunch. Taking advantage of the few rio I have left, I paid for a room in a decent inn I found, although I had to duck to enter. I say decent because it has four walls and a roof along with heating, which is much better than what we used the night before. Tomorrow, I'll have my Sky Island, so it's foolish to pay more than necessary. Chapter 7, Red Snow Since we finished buying everything, I decided to spend some time perfecting the mantra while playing with Haku. The game is simple, I blindfold myself and activate the mantra in a small radius to get used to recognizing the signals I receive. As I walk, I point at a signal and say if it's a man, woman, child, or animal, and Haku has to tell me if I'm right or wrong. So, you can probably imagine the scene. A giant being led by a young child with their eyes covered, randomly pointing at things. People crossed their arms, waiting for me to stumble, but too bad for them, it's easy to control what's within two meters of me. So even after several minutes, I kept walking without bumping into anything, and people got bored and went back to their business. It's getting better, Mr. Enel, Haku told me as he simply enjoyed the stroll in a new place. Keep it up. I have to admit that now that I'm experiencing it, Enel has left me impressed. To think he can hear that entire surface on the Sky Island shows that he's probably one of the best mantra users in the world, even with the support of the Devil Fruit. I can only sense the bioelectric signals of others at the moment, and my range is nowhere near as wide. I don't even attempt to listen to what they're saying or anything like that because I think it would overload me with information. One step at a time. After practicing for a while, I removed the blindfold and returned with Haku to the inn, asking them to serve us some food. They brought us steamed vegetables, chicken soup, and some bread. The vegetables are all right, the soup is quite watery, and don't get me started on the bread. I had to dip it in the soup to finish it, but considering the price I paid, I guess I couldn't expect freshly baked bread. I laughed when Haku poked my arm and asked if he could have another apple with puppy dog eyes. I think my apples just gained their first fan, so naturally, I gave him one. Both of us yawned and went to sleep, but I encountered a problem. The futon here is too small for me and only covers half of my body. When Haku saw my legs and head sticking out, he covered his mouth with his hands, trying to contain his laughter, unsuccessfully. Meh, at least my back is padded, it will have to do for now. I woke up the next morning and noticed something heavy on my right arm. I turned my head and saw that my arm had become a hugging pillow, courtesy of Haku. I'd take a picture if I could because it looks like a koala. Sky Island delivered. Go to XXXXX to claim it. Suddenly, the remaining sleep disappeared. I checked the time on the wall clock, which seemed about to fall, and saw that breakfast time had already passed, so we wouldn't get anything at the inn when we leave. Haku, get up, we have to go. Ten more minutes. If you get up, we can have lunch on a cloud. I'm awake, I'm awake. I've completely tamed him. By the way, how am I supposed to explain our relationship now? Am I his new father figure? Tutor? Master? Big brother? It's clear that I can't say we're twins, we don't have the same hair color, and that could give us away. I guess I'll wait to see if he tries to call me something other than Mr. Do we have everything? Yes. I checked twice. I wonder if this is how Tsunade feels with Shizun. Let's go, my special house is finished, and I think you'll like it. The island is located 10,000 meters above sea level, and I'll make it clear that I've taken care of things like oxygen supply, atmospheric pressure, altitude sickness, etc. Supposedly, beyond 8,000 meters of altitude is the death zone for humans, something I'm naturally going to use to my advantage. As for how Luffy and his crew survived there, I'm not worried. The world of One Piece is so crazy that there are even space pirates. Logic feels sad in that world. I want to get to the designated place quickly, so Haku ends up on my shoulders again as I take big steps to leave the village. I'm hearing that they've discovered that several people died nearby, I think they're referring to those Haku killed, and he seems to think the same because he's gripping my head tightly. 
We fall silent, I don't know what to say right now, and I can't keep distracting him every time. He needs to accept what he did, make amends, and let go little by little. We're passing through an infrequently traveled path, and I see blood stains in the snow. It has a vivid color without darkening, so it seems quite fresh. The direction of the trail is the same as where I need to go, so I guess I have no other choice. Haku, you have to listen to me now. If I pat your leg, you have to close your eyes and hold onto my head very tightly, okay? I told him with a serious but calm tone. Don't open them no matter what you hear. Can you do that for me? MMM. Haku nodded with determination, but I know he's not comfortable. Pinky promise. I raised my hand, and I could feel his small hand holding onto my pinky, so it seems like it's a pinky promise. He leaped onto the branches, and I'm moving forward slowly because I'm not used to using this mode for transportation, so I have to stop and look at which branch to jump to each time. I'm hearing metal clashes, screams, and explosions, so I guess some Kirigakur ninja squad must be fighting against a spy or something. Surrender, and we'll make your death less painful. That's right, Raza has turned you into a sacrifice for us, Kirigakur. Just accept your inevitable fate. Today is the day of your death, Pakara. Chapter 8, Is an Angel? I'm on a roll, first, I ran into Haku, and now I'm witnessing Pakara's desperate last fight. If I do nothing, she'll end up dead. Should I save her? By now, she must understand that she was sent to die by Raza and she must be very angry. If I make a move, I should be able to rescue her, and she'll owe me a favor. It happens that I know she has a decent sense of honor, and I think I could ask her to train Haku as a ninja, so he can control his ice release. Pakara of the Scorch style training Haku of the ice release style? I don't see any problem with that. Who goes there? One of the Kirigakur ninja found me, I don't know his rank, but since he spotted me, I'll assume he's a censor. Pakara turns around, she's covered in wounds and looks at me, half hopeful. But when she sees me and Haku instead of potential reinforcements, I can only see regret and despair in her eyes. Does she think she's dragged us into her final moments? Now I'm more inclined to help her. There must be no witnesses, kill them. I'm really inclined to help Pakara. Look at that kid. Long dark hair, pale skin. He's from the Yuki clan, we can't let them escape. Yes. It's official, I'm going to kill these guys. What better way to shed blood in the Naruto world than by saving a damsel in distress? Run. I see Pakara shout, and she seems willing to distract them, touching, but unnecessary. I tap Haku's leg with my palm, and he closes his eyes, holding onto my head tightly, as per our pinky promise. I see them throwing several kunao, thinking that will be enough, which offends me a bit, so I'll use them as practice targets. A million volts. Using mantra in a straightforward way, I locate all the life signals to avoid any ambush and send a direct electric shock with my arm strong enough to hit half of the Kirigakur ninja present, excluding Pakara. Wow, they seem to have been reduced to a pile of coke. Ninjutsu without seals. A Kirigakur ninja is surprised to see me attack without forming hand seals. Since their village mainly excels in water jutsu, those who use lightning jutsu tend to restrict themselves and often prefer to avoid confrontations with Kumagakur. You. Return to the village and report the mission anomaly, the one I assume is the squad leader orders a subordinate to leave. But what makes them think that's possible with me here? Divine punishment. I raise a hand while sending a discharge into the sky, which divides and precisely strikes the remaining Kirigakur ninja. The smell of burnt flesh is a bit unpleasant. Well, I'll assume these were just a bunch of Chunin with a Jonin leader at most, I don't think the elites would be so easy to kill, and if they are, better for me. Pakara seems to be under a genjutsu because she has a vacant look as she looks around. I guess it's normal, she was fighting alone with her life on the line, and then I come and kill everyone in seconds. Anyone would feel the comparison is hateful. I, I think she'll try to thank me, but there's no need for details right now. I raise a finger to her lips to hush her and point to Haku with my eyes closed. Wow, her lips are really smooth and soft. She seems to understand and doesn't say anything about the scene around us because of Haku. Oh, wait, she has fainted while standing up. I didn't know that was actually possible. Considering the wounds and blood loss she has, I guess it's normal. Well, it looks like I'll have my first guest even before arriving home. I hold her in a princess style, looking around to make sure there are no survivors. 
Haku, are your eyes still closed? Yes, but it stinks. Can I open them now? It's almost over, just wait a little longer, and the smell will go away. Turns out the sky island is right above my current location, so I partially elementalize and quickly ascend to the sky. Haku has reacted well and held on, but he almost falls due to the sudden impulse. I'll have to think of a way to ascend and descend more smoothly without requiring my presence. We pass through a layer of clouds and soon touch down, well, you get what I mean. You can open your eyes now, I tell Haku. Surprise! I shout dramatically. I'd open my arms, but I still have a kunoichi in my hands. Haku opens his eyes, and I feel his jaw drop against my head as he marvels at us standing on an actual cloud. I take out an apple and put it in his view. Here, I told you we'd eat apples on the clouds, right? It's funny that despite the shock and him looking in all directions, his body moves, and he eats the apple as a simultaneous task. Seriously, does he have to eat like a squirrel every time? Mr. Enel, where are we? I told you, this is my special house. It's a sky island. The angels took a little longer to finish it, so I only received it today, I joked. Is the woman in your arms an angel? He asks when he notices Pakara. I can't see her wings, but she's pretty. Not the first part, but yes to the second, I reply as I walk towards where the infirmary should be. I just rescued a beautiful lady from some bad men. Helping those in need, producing magical apples, impervious to harm, an island in the clouds. Are you sure I'm not a god? Haku was having an existential crisis as he descended and took off his shoes to feel the clouds beneath his feet. So fluffy. Be careful, not all clouds are walkable, and you wouldn't want to fall from the sky, I warn him as I move along one of the paths. Suddenly, Haku hurries to follow me closely and continues to look at Pakara. Are you going to give her a kiss to wake her up? The question is so abrupt that it makes me stumble despite walking on a flat path. Comment. 10 Comment. Vote. Chapter 9, The Founding of Simeigakur. I left Pakara on the cloud bed in the infirmary, and before proceeding to treat her, I whistled for three long seconds. Small creatures quickly responded to the call. Cloud foxes. Yes, there are a few creatures identical to Konis's pet. When I said I could feel lonely, I meant it, so I got some interesting animal specimens. Their fur is pinkish white with narrow, slitted eyes, fox-like ears, and a slightly slender snout, which I requested to be more normal because I found it strange. Their tails have brush-like tips and are relatively voluminous compared to their bodies. They are intelligent, can mimic to communicate, and can follow commands. The only difference from Konis's pet is that they don't make so but cue, although I don't know the reason for that. Haku jumps when he sees the cloud foxes arrive, tries to get closer to me, but it's too late, and the cloud foxes surround him and show no mercy as they lick his face. Ha ha ha, no stop licking, ha ha ha, I surrender. Ha ha ha, please. Enough, you're going to wear him out like a lollipop. The cloud foxes are very obedient and sit on the ground. Haku, from now on, we will live on this cloud, and your first task will be to explore the place with the cloud foxes. They will guide you and tell you where you can go and where you can't. I'll explain the areas to you later, okay? MMM. Haku is covered in drool, but that only makes his pale skin shine. It's like the world refuses to give him an ounce of masculinity. Alright, remember to pay attention to the foxes and watch where you step. When I see Haku has left, I turn to observe the patient Pakara. The cloud bed is turning pink from absorbing the blood she continues to lose, so I think it's better if I hurry. Remove clothing, disinfect wounds, apply hemostatic medicine, wrap tight bandages, redress her, and connect a solution bag to her arm to accelerate blood recovery. Estimated recovery time, I have no idea. I've only slept for one night, after all, and I only received some knowledge from Enel, first aid, and such. I'll need more sleep to become an expert in everything. Using the fruit's speed, I quickly glance around the island and nod satisfactorily that everything I requested is in place. A laboratory equipped with numerous human-sized capsules, a garden with a wide variety of crops that make you hungry just by looking at them, I saw Haku secretly eating a tomato, a library ready to be filled, eco-friendly cloud showers, scavenger clouds for waste disposal, etc. But of course, the best part is that it's a secret place where no one can surprise me. And even if I bring someone hostile here, 
one thought from me will make them fall from the cloud and crash to the ground at a height of 10 kilometers while reaching a fall speed of 443 meters per second. What should I call this place? Kumagakura is already taken, so I'll have to think of something that sets me apart from the other villages. Yes, I thought of creating my own village. No one said you need thousands of ninja to have your own village, I've seen some in the series with barely any ninja, and they still exist. Best of all, I won't have to pay taxes up here, nor do I have to cater to a daimyo's fragile ego. Let's see, there are the hidden villages of the leaf, rain, that one won't work, grass, waterfall, snow, star, moon, dream. Did the founders even try when thinking of names? It's more like, hey, from here, you can see the moon, let's make the hidden village of the moon. And the same goes for the rest, they seem like things they just casually saw. Let's follow the pattern, I can't disrespect tradition. Hmm, I'm in my second life, so I could use that as a name without further ado. See Mayagakur, the hidden village of life. There, that was easy. Oh, right, I have to think about the headband design. Since I'm going with the easy route, Let's go all the way, a bitten apple. Wow, establishing a hidden village is really easy, no wonder they pop up like mushrooms everywhere. Sigma, degree degree. How long did it take me, a minute? Now all that's left is to make the t-shirts, and ahem, I mean uniforms. I'll do that later, I'm sure I have some machines around here for that. I should go back and keep an eye on Pakara, who knows what she might think when she wakes up in this place. I just hope she doesn't start throwing explosions, thinking she's been kidnapped or something. Upon returning to the infirmary, I see that she's awake but somewhat stiff as she contemplates the whiteness of my glorious home. I approach her with the intention of starting the conversation, but after seeing me, she beat me to it with surprising calmness. Am I dead? Why does everyone have the same question when they meet me? At this rate, they'll make me believe I bring bad luck to people. Chapter 10, Job Offer in the area where Enel exterminated the Kirigakur ninja. A group from the same village was examining the area under the leadership of a red-haired Kunoichi with shark-like teeth who carried two swords on her back. Ame Arisama, the ambush on Pakara from the sand ended strangely, reported one of the masked ninjas. There isn't even a body left. Did she commit suicide with a final attack? I can see that, idiot, Ame Arai surveyed what remained of the bodies of their village's ninja and the burns on the trees. This isn't Pakara's handiwork, someone has meddled in our affairs and seems to have taken her. A third party got involved? But apart from Pakara's dried blood, we haven't found any other traces, the ninja replied, sounding doubtful. That's why I called you an idiot. Ame Arai shot him a disdainful look. Pakara's scorch style turns her enemies into mummies by using high temperatures to drain the fluids from their bodies. If she had done this, it wouldn't have ended like this, and the damage would have had a clear epicenter. It's more likely that the interloper was a fire or lightning user, but the power required to leave them in this state isn't small. At the very least, it's a jonin, she explained, a noticeable glint of interest in her eyes. The insulted ninja didn't protest but sweated under his mask. Every time this uncontrollable member of the mist swordsman smiled like this, it meant she had found a new prey to pursue. So far, the village hadn't said anything about it because it also served their purposes, as she had been eliminating ninja from other villages with potential to grow. Did I hear that members of the Yuki clan were discovered nearby? Ame Arai asked abruptly. Yes, but the civilians who went there never returned, and it's speculated they are dead. The Kunoichi fell silent as she contemplated. Send someone to ask if they've seen anything unusual in the last three days, she ordered. No matter how small the information is, it might give us a lead to follow. Yes. I hope I'm not disappointed this time. Ame Arai muttered as she kicked one of the charred bodies. Back on the island in the sky. My explanation seems to have refreshed Pakara's memory before she passed out. She looks at the bandages on her body and the bag connected to her arm for a moment before accepting that she survived the ambush. And all thanks to me, who happened to be passing by. I appreciate you for saving me, I see her sit up with some effort. Where exactly am I? She doesn't recognize the architectural style, which is normal. You are in Simeigakur. Pakara falls silent for a moment as she blinks thoughtfully, probably trying to find information in her head to figure out her location. But she won't find anything. I'm sorry, I've never heard of your village, she says with a tinge of embarrassment. That's normal, I founded it about, three minutes ago, 
I had to check the clock on the wall to be precise. I'll note the date later so we can celebrate the anniversary of the village's founding. How can we forget to throw a party for that? Pakara suddenly has an epiphany. No wonder she didn't know about the village, it was founded while she was unconscious. The hidden village of life, the name was really mysterious. And the shirtless man in front of her was even more so. Do you intend to return to Sunagakur? Raza seems to have made it clear that he wants to kill you even if it means sending you to your enemies. Why, are you planning to invite me to your newly established village? Pakara puts on a pained and sad expression as she asks with irony. She gave everything for Sunagakur and even performed tasks she loathed when ordered by her superiors because she was loyal to the village. She never expected that after everything she had done, Raza would have the determination to actually kill her. She always thought the most that coward would dare to do was to put obstacles in her ninja career. Was she too naive? Her heart hurt a lot right now. I suppose that founding the village makes me a cage, so yes, if you're willing, I'd love to have a kunoichi like you in Simeigakur, from my perspective, Pakura's encounter was like an opportunity sent from heaven. I still intend to make her Haku's mentor if possible, creating an emotional bond that ties her to this place. Her character is quite good compared to most ninja in the world, and it aligns with my style. Plus, she's beautiful, and that always adds positive points. Are you serious? Pakara raises her head in astonishment, realizing that I wasn't joking. Do you think I'd joke in this situation? I raised an eyebrow as I crouched down next to the cloud bed so she wouldn't have to strain her neck too much, she's still injured. You've paid a life to the village by becoming a sacrifice unknowingly. From my perspective, this should clear your conscience to choose whether to risk returning to those who wanted to kill you or to turn the page and start anew somewhere else. Pakara remains silent, but she's completely focused on me. Now, let me remind you that even if you return, given what happened, you might still be branded a traitor since your duty was to die to secure peace with Kirigakur, I pointed out. If you're going to end up like this, why not take the initiative? I can see that she's becoming uneasy, her gaze filled with indecision and confusion. Hey, I'm not asking for an answer right now. Recover for a couple of days, and then I'll come to hear your response. If you accept, I'll welcome you with open arms. If you refuse, once you're recovered, I'll escort you out of the village and you can go wherever you want, I raised a finger to emphasize the importance of what I was saying. But I'll ask you to stay in this room while you reflect and recover, or I'll have to take measures to keep the village safe. I like you, so I really prefer not to have to resort to that, all right. Pakara nods in understanding. It's already good that she was saved and treated. If the village has just been founded, sensitive information like its location is crucial. It would be really strange to tell her she can move around freely without surveillance. All right, I whistle again, and after a moment, Haku returns with the cloud foxes, his mouth smeared with tomato seeds. Well, the farmland is there for eating, after all. One of you will stay to keep this lovely lady company, I tell the cloud foxes, who respond by moving their paws in a comical military salute before looking at Haku. I'll be a bit busy for the next two days while I check out our new home. The patient has strict instructions to rest and can't leave this place, so she'll need someone to take care of her and prepare her meals. I wonder where I could find someone. I raise my gaze to the ceiling while I stroke my chin thoughtfully. I, I choose me. Haku raises his hand, jumping and offering himself eagerly. Are you sure you can take care of her? It's a very important mission, I look at him with uncertainty. I can. Haku puts his hands on his hips and assures with confidence. He has taken care of his mother many times in the past and knows what to do. All right, you're hired. Then I'll have to ask you to take care of me, young lady. Pakara tries to contain her laughter, watching our behavior, and decides to play along. I'm a boy. Haku crosses his arms and pouts in annoyance. Pakara freezes, her mouth wide open, searching for the truth in her eyes. Do I tell her? No, I'll choose the third option and vanish in front of them. After Enel left, Haku approaches the cloud stool next to Pakara's bed and asks her a question. Do you like apples? Chapter 11, Making History Did I perhaps ask for too much? I pondered while crouched at the highest point after spending the last two days exploring the Sky Island. I was amazed by my own ideas and how comprehensive the island had become. I don't recall asking for certain rooms, but they were there. Whether it was for domestic needs, entertainment, experimentation, or others, 
there were enough facilities for hundreds of people to live on the island comfortably. I didn't originally intend for there to be so many people, but this is my private domain, even though I've named it a village. However, you never know, it's better to have this space and not need it than to need it and not have it. I'm pleased with the navigation system that allows me to move the island and the camouflage that makes it appear as a solitary cloud, changing shape with the wind from the outside. Weatheria had a huge bubble at the bottom of the cloud, which was undoubtedly eye-catching to anyone who paid constant attention to the clouds, like the people from the Nara clan. Haku has been working hard to take care of Pakara and worm his way into her cracked heart, repairing the fissures with his presence and increasing the chances that she'll decide to stay. I was honest with the options I gave her. Even if she chooses to join me, she'll still feel nostalgia for Sunagakur, but as long as they don't provoke me, I see no reason to bother with them. They are literally the poorest and most resource-deprived village among all, including the smallest ones and mine, so I have no reason to waste my time going there. Unless the condition for Pakara to join me is to kill Raza as revenge, in which case everything is different. One life for Pakara's loyalty seems like a bargain, and if I'm honest, I would actually be doing a favor to his children and his village, based on what I know about him. I asked Pakara if they had any unique specialties once I brought her the food, but apart from her pioneering research on ninja puppets, some rare metals, and unlimited quantities of sand, it seems that the village really doesn't have anything noteworthy, or she chose not to disclose it. Observing Pakara and Haku using mantra was good practice for eavesdropping on distant conversations. If I had attempted something like this in the village, it would be like having dozens of people talking in my ear at once, as I still haven't figured out how to be selective about what I want to hear. I also came to the conclusion that requesting the cloud foxes was a great move. The little ones take care of the garden and other places without me having to tell them anything, as if they were little elves tending to the house. That means that even if I'm gone for a few days, the foxes and Haku shouldn't have any issues in my absence, aside from possibly feeling a little lonely. Today, I'll ask Pakara for her decision. Using mantra, I was able to listen in on her conversations with Haku discreetly, gathering information about me, my personality, or how she met me. Haku is quite innocent, but it seems he's not as clueless as he appears. While he happily explained most things to her, he selectively omitted a few, like when I showed him that he couldn't harm me or where I got my apples. The fact that he didn't inquire about this place despite its obvious uniqueness makes me wonder if it was a conscious decision or if there was another reason. I've read some fanfics where the MC used Enel's abilities to examine someone's body's nervous response to determine if they were lying or not, but I simply don't know the principles behind that OR if it's even possible. Another thing to add to the to-do list for experimentation. How are you this lovely morning? I asked Pakara as I examined her from top to bottom, checking the bandages that were no longer stained with blood. Thanks to all of you, I'm feeling much better Pakara thanked me but became a bit uneasy upon seeing me, and I knew the reason but I couldn't help but laugh a couple of times at it. At some point during her conversations with Haku, she thanked him for bandaging her wounds, but Haku told her that I was the one who did the work, and that added a hint of pink to her cheeks the next time she saw me. Even more so when I had to change her bandages, and she was conscious this time. No, I didn't accept her idea of doing it herself. That was a dangerous idea. What if she didn't apply the bandages correctly or tied them too tightly? I have to take care of my patient slash guest properly, and I can do that since I received medical knowledge mainly during these nights. Could it be that the knowledge I need takes priority when I'm asleep? Because if that's the case, I won't complain. I told her she could treat me as a doctor if that made her more comfortable, as people generally don't find it embarrassing to expose their bodies to a doctor. And it worked, I think. In fact, if I think about it a bit, Pakura is an elite kunoichi who received strict training, and it's impossible that she didn't take a lesson or two on seduction or something like that at some point, right? Then she should have better control over feelings like embarrassment or shyness in theory. Now I'm wondering if she's pretending or if she's relaxed enough with us to act like herself. Oops, I'm rambling. Let's get back to reality. Mr. Enel, did I do well? She asked me with a smile. She knows the answer, but she still wants to hear me say it. She really is a child. Thank you for your hard work these days, Haku I raised my hand and patted his head. I realized that he loved it when I did that, so if it made him happy, I saw no reason not to indulge him. His hair has also become softer, straighter and silkier since I taught him how to properly clean it, which unintentionally makes him look more feminine. Even Pakara asked him the secret of his hair. According to her, 
it's not easy to keep your hair hydrated and beautiful in such a warm climate. Can I hear your decision? I asked Pakara as I sat down next to the bed. I found a lower chair to minimize my height, but it doesn't make much of a difference unless I sit on the floor. What do you expect from me if I join? What would be my job, responsibilities? I see where this is going, and I like it. The fact that she hasn't refused shows that she's seriously considering it. I gathered my thoughts for a moment and explained to her bluntly what I wanted her to do and what I expected from her, some necessary restrictions, and the benefits she would receive. In summary, you want me to become Haku's teacher? Pakura asked, amazed. Without asking her to kill someone, steal supplies, or obtain confidential information. Do you find it too challenging? I said with a teasing tone. Pakura, will you become my sensei? Came the moment of the surprise attack. Haku used a combination of moves, puppy eyes and pouting lips. Pakura receives a critical hit. All right, from today. I will be a kunoichi of Sime Gakur. I will be in your care in the future Pakura seemed to expend all her strength saying that, but a wave of peace washed over her when she did. She had been thinking about it a lot and realized something disheartening. Even if Raza was the one who wanted to kill her, it was impossible for the higher UPS to ignore the decision. But no one told her anything, not a warning sign or a subtle hint of what would happen. They simply gave up on her. Did they really think she would accept to die like that? Well. There's just one last step I took out two headbands and a kunao that I had extracted from Pakara's arm earlier, which, luckily for everyone, didn't touch bone, from the nightstand next to the cloud bed. One was the headband Pakara originally had when I found her, showing the symbol of Sunagakur. The other had a bitten apple on it, and the fabric was a warm and pleasing shade of yellow, as if it had been dyed with turmeric. I got the idea of the golden apple. Does it show too much? Oh, I don't care. Pakara received the three items and understood what I expected her to do, an act to demonstrate that she was cutting ties with her past and accepting a new phase in her life. She felt particularly moved when, despite taking two minutes to look at them, I patiently waited for her to act. Taking a deep breath, Pakara firmly held the kunao with familiarity and with a single motion, personally made a notch in her sunagakur headband. From that moment on, there was no turning back. You've just become the first official ninja of Simeigakur in history. Congratulations. Pakara looked excited and suddenly widened her eyes. What had I just said? Chapter 12, We Are Family. Aren't you a ninja as well? Pakara asked me with trembling lips after replacing her headband before, with those Kirigakur ninjas, you. I can't even use chakra, so, no, I don't think that can be considered ninjutsu, right? I was having a lot of fun with her reaction come on, you've been cooped up in here for two days. I think some fresh air will do you good. Don't you agree, Haku? We exchanged glances, and he quickly understood what I meant, putting on a mischievous expression as if preparing to play a joke. Yes, definitely Haku nodded happily as he helped Pakura to her feet follow me, Pakura sensei, I'll show you our village. Oh, I can see how Pakura can't help but smile when she's called sensei. It seems like Haku did a great job. I'll give him an extra apple later. I followed them just one step behind, getting a close-up of the expression on the first kunoichi of my new village as she saw the outside. Are we on a cloud? She even stepped on the ground several times to make sure it really was a cloud it's very nice to step on, but firm she murmured. We are on a sky island I gave her a brief summary without going into too much depth for now, it's just the three of us, plus the cloud foxes in this place. Haku joined me in laughing when Pakara entered a shocked state. But how? We have clean water, abundant food, facilities, and many things you'll see as you get used to your new life I explained to her it's a lot to take in, so take it easy. For now, let me show you the training grounds and where you'll be living. I know there are many places for her to choose from, but I prefer to organize her locations so that if there are more people in the future, I can easily locate them in the same area. And this is the training ground I said after showing her a level that had an area the size of a soccer field if you need additional equipment or ninja supplies, I need you to make a list and I'll go down to the mainland to get them. I have a couple of things in mind Pakara nodded, satisfied with the place. Suddenly, I felt the urge to get some money. Do you happen to have a bingo book by any chance? I asked her suddenly. If I remember correctly, the bodies of people like Asuma can be exchanged on the underground black market for several million ryo. Being one of the few people we are right now, 
I think it should last for a while if I hunt a couple of small fry. In fact, I have one that was published two months ago she took a pocket-sized book from her pants and handed it to me, probably understanding my train of thought. As a newly established village, the need for money is logical. I quickly glanced at it and nodded, understanding what my next goal would be. Sewing some zippered pockets into my pants. Will our village not take missions like the others? Pakara asked me with interest. We're not like the others I replied, closing the book with a wave of my hand taking missions means that others can tell us what to do. Maybe we'll accept requests, but they'll have to convince us it's worth doing. I see Pakara's mouth hanging open again. I'm not building a village just for it to be like all the others, I prefer to do things my way, and I won't allow others to tell me what to do just because they have money in their pockets. Haku, if we're missing something in the kitchen like spices or utensils, you should also make a list. In the future, I hope you can become responsible for managing the island in my absence. I won't let you down, Mr. Enel. Haku clenched his little fists while looking at me with determination. Didn't you want to become a ninja? Pakara is probably confused because if Haku will be doing administrative work here safely in the future, teaching him probably doesn't make much sense in her opinion. I want him to have the strength to defend himself if he goes down to the mainland and to be able to control his ability I replied while resting the bingo book on my shoulder as you may have noticed, Haku belongs to the Yuki clan, and not teaching him control can be, problematic in the long run. Alright, I assure you that in a few years, not even a Chunin will be able to threaten him Pakara assured. Do it with a Jonin in mind I encouraged her to aim higher focus on training him in the use of Senbons, stealth techniques and his ice release. Why Senbons? Haku doesn't like taking lives, so making him an expert in neutralizing and paralyzing would be more desirable for him I explained to Pakara while patting Haku's head again, happy that I wouldn't force him to kill and if he learns stealth, he's less likely to need to fight and more likely to escape if he encounters a too powerful enemy. Delivering a ninja alive is much more desirable because their memories can be examined, providing valuable information unless they have a very powerful seal. It also makes the reward price higher than if they were dead. It won't be a problem but he'll need to practice a lot and study, it won't be easy. What Enel was asking for wasn't much different from training an ANBU. If the person being trained didn't have talent or motivation, it would be difficult. I'll make sure to become useful for Mr. Enel. Wow, the feeling of being needed really runs deep in him. Haku, remember this. It's not about being useful, we're family, and we take care of each other, alright? Your life will always be the top priority above all else I had to kneel down to look him in the eyes. Yes, Mr. Enel. I'm sorry. I hugged him, hoping he truly understood. Family, hey. Pakara looked enviously at the scene. What are you doing standing there? I asked her as I extended my other arm come here. No, it's too embarrassing she had just joined, she wasn't ready. Too bad for her, I decided to ignore her response, and when she blinked, that was my moment to move Haku and me so that she was within my reach. Kia. Pakara is now part of the group hug. This is nice. Vop Pakara. A shirtless man is hugging me. She thought in panic as she felt his hard chest against her cheeks as he sending me some kind of signal by saying we're family, or am I just imagining things? Pull yourself together, Pakara. Chapter 13, First Reward. Haku, do you think Pakara has been acting strange these days? MMM Haku thought for a moment, then shook his head Pakara Sensei seems a bit distracted, but I think it's normal. Maybe she misses some of her friends? Maybe. I pondered for a while and decided that it's probably because she's not used to living in a place like this, where the shower is actually a miniature rain cloud. She must be constantly asking me how things work since common sense doesn't apply here in her opinion, and that might have stressed her out a bit. I'll go down to the mainland for a few days. Pay attention to your teacher's lessons, I'll ask her when I return. Don't worry, Mr. Enel, I'll work really hard. After saying goodbye to everyone, I leaped from the edge of the island and transformed to descend and land a few meters from where I originally ascended. Unlike the last time I was here, I now have a headband from my village tied at the top of my thigh and new pockets in my pants while a backpack hangs from my shoulder. I still haven't decided on the design of the uniform, so I'm not wearing one. Now, let's see. Should I collect some Kirigaku heads, or should I take a stroll and see what I find while buying the supplies they asked for? I contemplated while looking at the scorch mark the first left on the ground with my landing I need to improve my control. I think I'll go back to the village from last time. 
I'm curious about how the whole situation with the men who died attacking Haku under the instigation of his father ended. It only takes me a moment to orient myself, and I travel there in an instant using my elemental form. But as soon as I set foot in the village, I can sense something strange in the air. The civilians already regarded me with suspicion last time, but now they seem even more frightened by my presence. I activate my mantra and immediately pick up stronger bioelectric responses around me than usual. Did the Kirigakura ninja somehow manage to track down the incident? Incredible. And is their response stronger because they have stronger bodies, or does Chakra influence it in some way? Halt right there. Hmm? I turned to see a Kirigakura ninja with a mask on his face, strange, I thought those were only used for bounty hunters do you need something from me? I asked while scratching my nose with the lobe of my left ear. Yes, it turns out I can control my earlobes, which is convenient. I don't have to put down a book if my nose itches, I can scratch it while still reading. Haku found this fact very amusing and laughed a lot. Identify yourself he seems to have noticed the headband on my right thigh which village do you belong to? And state your purpose. My village is Simeigakur, and I came here for some trades. The ninja falls silent and I can't see his expression due to the mask, but I assume he's doing the same as Pakura did once. Is it a recently founded village? He asks with evident doubt. Yes. Where is its location? Confidential. It's a hidden village, after all I replied, shrugging a truly hidden one, I mean. Yes, I openly mock them for calling themselves hidden villages when everyone knows where they are. I have the feeling that he just furrowed his brow in annoyance because of that but I have no proof. Where is the child who was with you? He suddenly asks. I raised an eyebrow intrigued. Is he trying to make me accidentally divulge information? It seems they do know about us or managed to identify Haku as a remnant of the Yuki clan, given that I was with him here a few days ago. It's logical to assume that they're inquiring about his current whereabouts. Confidential. I'm sure no matter my answer, he will try to interrogate me, so I just replied with the first thing that came to mind. Enough, you will come with us to answer some questions in private I see him raise his hand, and they surround me. So predictable. One, two, there are a total of eight, including the one who talked to me so far. I refuse, attack. The Kirigakura ninja prepare to charge at me, but they realize that the order to attack didn't come from their leader but from the target, which makes them hesitate as they almost trip over each other and look at each other confused. A quick question I took the bingo book from my new pocket and opened it to the section on Kirigakura while observing the faces of the others, who don't have masks. I guess they're more common ninjas do any of you have a bounty? Are you making fun of us? A guy with dreadlocks and bandages covering his nose asked. Ask, and you shall receive answers I see that the first face matches perfectly with the photo in the book let's see your information. Name, Takeda. Affiliation, Kirigakura. Estimated strength. Chunin. Nickname, The Drowned. Bounty, 5 million ryo. Information, uses water ninjutsu to slowly suffocate and enjoys killing his victims during the process. Several minor nobles from the land of water have died at his hands. While I read the information, I remain still and feel kunao and shurikens piercing me, causing nothing more than a few tickles. Does he have any techniques like those of the Hojiki clan? You will come with me he declared as he put the book away and walked toward Takeda. What are you waiting for? The masked ninja said capture him alive. They charge at me while two of them start forming hand seals. Hidden mist technique. I have to contain my laughter, it's the worst technique they could have considered using against me. With my mantra, I can locate them without a problem, and I've already memorized which one is Takeda. I point my index finger at one of the signals and squeeze my thumb like a trigger, shooting a lightning bolt in his direction. At such speed and such a short distance, the ninja can't react in time, and the signal disappears. The other ninja in the mist are surprised when they stop feeling the chakra of one of their comrades, but they still can't locate their target. Two minutes later. That was an unnecessary waste of time, and now I'll have to find another place for trades. Don't you agree, Takeda? I asked the ninja hanging from my shoulder right, I paralyzed your nerves with a discharge to your medulla oblongata, it doesn't matter. That was a rhetorical question I took out the bingo book again and flipped to the last page fortunately, there are some marks where I can leave you, I don't want to burden myself with you for too long. When the civilians came out of their houses, the mist vanished after they heard the sound of thunder, and only ashes remained on the ground. 
20 minutes later. A Mayurai arrived at the scene of the battle and frowned when she saw the headband of her village among the ashes, half melted. So, you're still nearby. Chapter 14, Apple Puree So, you're telling me I brought him back alive for nothing, right? I repeated what the man who's paying me to deliver Takeda said. I'm really sorry, sir, but the bonuses for live deliveries only apply to Takubutsu Jonin, Jonin, and Cage levels, as they're the ones with access to valuable information. Elite Chunin and below are essentially cannon fodder who don't know anything important. Well, what can you do? I stabbed my finger into Takeda's forehead and killed him instantly by frying his brain there you go, now give me my money. Right away. The man was an employee of the underground exchange and couldn't help but sweat as he saw how easily I took Takeda's life. I can't believe there are 5 million Ryo in this piece of paper. Ninja seals are so convenient I thought as I looked at the scroll in my hand when I left the place it's a hassle too because I can't open it. I guess I'll keep it and ask Pakura to open it for me later. I could have asked them to put it in a suitcase, but I thought getting an extra free storage scroll was better than the suitcase I could buy in a store. It's inconvenient not being able to use chakra in this world I complained as I took out an apple and prepared to take a bite. But a moment later, the apple was no longer in my hand, it was flying through the air, splitting into two identical halves that were caught by a red-haired kunoichi with shark-like teeth. It looks like my intuition wasn't wrong, you really went to collect a bounty she said as she bit into one half of the apple in her hand this is great. Where did you get these? They're homegrown I have a feeling I've seen this kunoichi in the series but I can't quite recall her how can I assist a lovely lady like you? Are you mocking me? I see her furrow her brow and show her teeth, clearly angry with my comment. Did she really think my comment was insincere? Perhaps Enel's expression is too blank? No, the surprised expression was quite evident in the series. And I do think she's a striking beauty, though I admit I'm not a fan of her current hairstyle. Look into my eyes, do you think I'm mocking you? She approaches me and stands two meters away while raising her gaze, growing increasingly furious. Are you calling me short? She shouts at me as she unsheathes the dual swords from her back, and they crackle with electricity along their blades. I give up, she has her own train of thought. You're the one who took Pakara, right? She asks while pointing her sword at my neck. Well, she tries to, but she can't reach because she's a bit shorter than Pakara. I'm starting to feel like doing something but I have to restrain myself. Yes. I see her open her mouth in surprise, maybe she expected me to try to lie or deny it. It's good that you admit it. Now I have the perfect excuse to hunt you down she tells me while smiling and showing her teeth menacingly. Oh, I remember now. Red hair, dual swords, shark-like teeth. Isn't this a Mayurai Ringo? I can't take it anymore, I crouch down and start scratching her under the chin as if she were a cat. She's so stunned that she doesn't know how to react for a few seconds. Meow I joke. What are you doing? She exclaims when she snaps out of it. I can see that her cheeks are turning red. Maybe the ruthless Amaiurai of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist doesn't have much experience in matters of love? The thought crosses my mind, but I find it unlikely. Although she's a bit wild, and her current outfit isn't very attractive, she's a complete beauty in her own way, like Pakara. I don't think she hasn't had guys interested in her. Do you want to go on a date? I ask her with a disappointed tone and expression. Genuine, I must add. I thought it might be my first romance in this world. Ironically, I think Ringo means apple, so it's a bit like destiny. Are you serious? She looks at me for a minute until she realizes I'm not joking and shakes her head. Did I just see pain in her gaze? I think I'm missing something but there's not much information about her in the first place, and it's hard to remember all at once. Let's not waste any more time, get ready to die. With that warning, she lunges at me and starts slashing with Kaiba again. I begin to dodge, not out of fear of getting hurt, but because I don't want her to accidentally destroy the scroll with the five million inside in my backpack. I can see her surprise when she watches me dodge her attacks with as much ease as if I were dancing. Perhaps it's because her own style of attack is also similar to a dance. She seems to be taking it as a challenge to accelerate her own speed enough to cut me, but minutes pass, and she doesn't manage to touch a single hair on me. Does she think she can be faster than lightning? What's strange is that she hasn't used any ninjutsu or electric shocks against me, which, if I remember correctly, are the specialty of the swords she carries in her hand. After dodging her last strike, I see her panting and leaning on her knees to catch her breath. 
I step forward and give her a small electric shock to paralyze her gently, but instead, I'm surprised to see her spit out a large amount of blood and fall backward. This is getting stranger by the minute. She shouldn't exhaust herself so quickly, let alone react like this to my attempt to neutralize her gently. Wait a minute. You're dying, aren't you? I ask her, almost as an affirmation. Pathetic, isn't it? She responds with a slightly hoarse voice as she tries to lift her head to look at me I trained hard all my life in atrocious conditions, and now, because of an illness out of nowhere, I've lost so much strength that I can't even use my chakra anymore. Okay, that clarifies what happened earlier. Is that why you turned down my date? I interrupt her in the middle of her dying speech while I sit down beside her and place her head on my thigh. It feels comfortable a I laughs with a mouth full of blood, too weak to resist. She can't even hold on to Kaiba, she probably can't even feel her hands anymore. How much time do you have left? According to the doctor, I should have died two weeks ago. He must be so embarrassed. She laughs again while coughing up more blood although I'm not any better, I couldn't even die in a real fight. Do you want to live? Who wouldn't? She answers once her breathing calms down a bit do you have a way by any chance? Spit it out, everything has a price in this life. I'll save you, and you'll be mine. Damn, you're even more straightforward than I am she loses her humor when she realizes I'm not joking, and her voice trembles are you serious? Why? Do you find me unattractive as a future husband? Your ears are weird she responds to my surprise but. I like tall men, and I don't think I've ever seen anyone taller than you. Living also means you won't be part of Kirigakur anymore. To hell with them. I've never had a single day off in my life. We're a match, then I say with a smile, and we both laugh. She looks me in the eyes, I can see that she's scared of dying, but there's a last glimmer of hope in her gaze after hearing me out. Eat this she takes out a golden apple and offers it to me. A Mayurai opens her mouth, but it seems she's worse off than I expected because she doesn't even have the strength to bite into the apple. With no other option, I take a bite of the apple myself and chew it enough before bringing it to her lips. A Mayurai Ringo's first kiss had a sweet taste of apple and blood. Chapter 15, Reaffirm the Position People on the street witnessed a very peculiar scene. A short, red-haired Kunoichi was constantly stabbing a tall, shirtless man all over, but the man didn't seem affected in the slightest. He only complained when the woman stabbed his pants. How does it exactly work? A Mayurai asked me as she stabbed my chest for the tenth time, showing a curious expression like Haku's. I'm immune to physical attacks, think of it like the Hojiki clan's hydration technique, but in my case, I'm the embodiment of lightning, I explained. Stop stabbing my pants. Do you want to have a honeymoon right here and now? Tisk. You're no fun, A Mayurai grumbled as she lowered Kaiba while turning her head to hide her flushed cheeks. It had been an hour since her impossible recovery, and she was still embarrassed about how she behaved in what she thought would be her inevitable deathbed. She didn't expect to leave Kirigakur pursuing what she thought would be her last meal and end up miraculously healing and defecting from the village she grew up in, to join a newly established one. And least of all, to end up with a fiancé. She had focused so much on swordsmanship and getting Kaiba from a young age that by the time she achieved her goal, her personality and reputation only instilled fear or respect in the male side. Combined with her illness, which guaranteed an early death before reaching 25, she had given up the foolishness of dreaming about love. She never expected to find herself in this situation. I couldn't find exact dates or her age before the illness claimed her life, so let's assume she's 22 in this timeline. Enel was tall, powerful, confident, and mysterious. It didn't seem so bad to have someone care for her, it was a novel feeling for someone who grew up under the blood mist's policy. I like that smile, A Mayurai touched her face, not understanding when she started smiling. Shut up. Give me another one of those apples, she demanded, shouting and reaching out her hand. The sharp teeth she had grown up with had always been used to threaten and instill fear in her enemies. It felt strange to her when she told him that she liked his smile. Sure, dear, I teased as I handed her another apple. It's funny how she has moments of Tsundera and others where she's brutally direct. You. The Kunoichi could only take an annoyed bite of the apple to calm herself. The problem was that the taste of the apple reminded her of her first kiss, which made her even more agitated. You said we would return to the village, so why are we buying these things? A Mayurai asked looking at the large bag on my back. It was very convenient that the Kunoichi joined me, 
so I could use some of the ceiling scroll money for the purchases. Although the village is mostly self-sufficient, due to its location, there's no way to establish a trade route with it yet, so we're missing some things. Where is our village? I don't want to spoil the surprise, I told her, giving her a smile as I noticed how naturally she used the word R. She was adapting quickly. Whatever. Ame Arai grumbled as she finished the apple and reached out her hand again, where I silently deposited another apple in tacit understanding. She really liked my apples. By the way, what's your position in Sime Gakur? I founded it, so I guess I'm the... Seekage? Say Mikage. I'm not exactly sure what the correct mnemonic word would be, so I stuck with Say Mikage for now. Is it correct, or what do you think would be the title for the cage of Sime Gakur? So you're both the founder and the cage, not bad, she liked men with initiative and despised cowards. Knowing she would be the wife, wait a minute. Do you intend to have multiple wives? It depends on how things develop, but it's possible, I replied honestly about my personal desires as I turned to look her in the eyes. Do you mind the idea? I asked, interested in her reaction. Nah, it's normal for cage and powerful people to have multiple wives, she shook her head, much to my surprise before narrowing her eyes. But I'll be the first wife, and if I'm going to have a sister, I hope you're not selfish and also listen to my opinion. It seems like I still need to adapt to this world's culture. I think that's fair, I agreed because I was pretty sure that unless I found a woman with a weak character, it wouldn't be a problem to get a mayorize approval. A relationship is a two-way street after all, especially in my foreseeable future, and I never intended to have what they call trophy wives. And one last thing. She reached out again towards my neck, but realizing that I wasn't wearing a shirt, she hung onto my neck and held my head in her hands, looking into my eyes with a promise of pain in her gaze. If the thought of having children ever crosses your mind, you better make me your first choice, or I'll turn you into a eunuch. Is that clear? Damn, lady. It would be much more intimidating if her face weren't as red as a grenade when she made that declaration. How can I resist when you're so direct and sincere? I took advantage of her position and kissed her when her guard was down. I felt her tense for a moment in surprise, but she relaxed and didn't pull away. I promise, I told her after a few seconds of enjoyment. You better. She said in a low voice before getting off me and standing by my side as we continued walking. I sighed in relief that she didn't think of pulling my ears. Should I cut my earlobes to a normal size? It would only take two weeks to heal such a small wound even less if I cauterize it with a small discharge. Hmm, I'll think about it later. The idea of self-mutilation just for aesthetic reasons never appealed to me. Back to reality, I needed to figure out a way to get supplies without having to personally go every time to fetch them. The first thing that came to mind was using something like the summoning jutsu, which is a space-time technique. However, Haku was just starting to learn about being a ninja, and Pakura would be too busy teaching Haku. Neither of them had knowledge of Fuinjutsu needed to set up a round-trip platform. It seems I need to find and, ahem, invite an expert in high-level sealing techniques. Chapter 16, No Chakra The idea of having a sealing expert was quite appealing to me, as I assume all villages would want one in this world. It's a pity that the land of whirlpools was already raided and burned down a long time ago from what Amaerai told me, so I can't bring two or three families to my village. But in my case, I thought that since I don't use chakra, I could ask the expert to place a seal on my body to store chakra in a similar way to how Tsunade does with her yin seal. This way, when I need to use something simple that requires chakra, like sealing scrolls, I can do it under the premise of recharging the reserves from time to time. It's not perfect, but it would suffice. You can't imagine a Mayorai's expression when I told her I don't use chakra. She immediately grabbed my wrist, and I saw a blue energy emanate from her fingers and sink into my body. It must be the well-known chakra, but why does it seem like she's examining my spiritual roots as if she were an immortal cultivator? Strange. As expected, A. Mayurai looked at me wide-eyed before confirming my suspicions. I don't have chakra pathways because my body ultimately belongs to the One Piece universe, where no one uses or inherits this energy. I explained my sealing idea to her, but she said it was unlikely to work. Without chakra pathways, how could you store and use it? I have to admit she has a point. But she also said that maybe there was some trick or secret known only to experts, so I would have to find one to confirm it. Isn't this where Pakura was ambushed? She asked, remembering the location. Yes, hold my hand tightly, 
and get ready to see the village. Is it so close to Kirigakur? Amei was surprised because if someone had established a village so close to one of the five great Shinobi countries, they should have been discovered in a matter of hours before they even started building. Nevertheless, she took Enel's hand, and before she could ask what to do next, she felt herself propelled into the sky and ended up standing on a cloud. What the hell was that? Welcome to the sky island of Simeigakur, I declared while making a theatrical gesture with my free arm. Are you serious? She stepped on the cloud several times to check if she was dreaming and looked at the vegetation growing in an impossible place if the education she received was correct. I've known you for just a day, and you already sent me to heaven, literally. Come on, I'll leave my things and introduce you to everyone. How big is the population, including me? Four people, and half of them are ninjas, I told her succinctly. A village of four people. We also have some cloud foxes, they are very hard-working and adorable creatures. I see, a Mayorai sighed, suddenly understanding some things. Now I understand why you said you didn't have a trade route. Apart from that old fart from Iwegakur, I don't know anyone who can fly. And I doubt I have the energy to reach such a high place. Yes, this is a true hidden village. Will you give me my new headband now? She asked. Since I hadn't expected to find her, I couldn't give her the new headband until we got back home. Should I carry a spare headband with me from now on? After I introduce you to everyone, I whistled, and shortly afterward, I saw a small shadow launch towards me. Mr. Enel. Haku looked at me happily. Did you behave while I was away? MMM. She nodded. I can feel Chakra now. Really? Yes, Pakara arrived a bit later because she's still cautious about where she steps. It seems her Chakra pathways unlocked without anyone's intervention, which is why she can instinctively use ice release. I just explained what Chakra is, and she could feel it in no time. She sighed, impressed. She's very talented. Haku is amazing, I rubbed her head as she liked while placing the bag on the ground. Here's most of the things you asked for. Who is she, Mr. Enel? Haku was so excited to see me that she didn't notice the kunoichi next to me until now. Aime Arai Ringo. Pakura recognized one of the famous swordsmen from Kirigakur and looked at me in surprise. Why did you bring her here? Do you want the long version or the short one? I asked. The short one. She tried to kill me and ended up becoming my wife. Pakura and Haku's minds went into a Windows error state. Isn't that going from one extreme to another? Don't go so fast, you still owe me the wedding, the ring, the food, and the whole package, Aime Arai protested in a low voice, feeling strange that I introduced her as my wife so happily. Are we going to have a wedding? Haku asked suddenly, filled with excitement. Just, how? Pakura was still in limbo. Was I too concise? Nah, if she wanted to know the details, she would have asked for the long version. At some point, yes, I replied to Haku. For now, what you need to know is that she has joined the village. Can I count on you to store everything I've brought while I show her around? If it were someone else, I would let Haku or Pakura do it, but this is my future wife, and I have to do the tour myself. Haku nodded, and to my surprise, she whistled in the exact same way I did. The cloud foxes came and took the bag with supplies while Haku gave them instructions. Wow, I didn't expect Haku to connect so well with the cloud foxes. When she's not training or studying, she spends her day playing with them, Pakura commented while still looking at Amei in amazement. I think she's inadvertently training them. I didn't expect you to join the village either, Pakura, Amei said, recognizing a familiar face in this place. I didn't have another choice, it was either that or become a wandering renegade. Pakura sighed as she covered her eyes with her palm. How did he manage to win your heart in less than a day? Pakura looked up and breathed in the fresh air, feeling refreshed and clear-headed. I guess. I just like the taste of apples, she said, licking her lower lip, as if recalling a pleasant memory. Chapter 17, I Forgot About You So, is it normal for the water on the Sky Island to be as white as milk? Amei asked me with a puzzled look after I gave her a tour and showed her the outdoor pool. I know, it's a strange feature that I don't remember. When we shower, drink water, or use it for irrigation, it's clear. But in the pool and hot springs, the water is completely white. Could it be that because the bottom is white and the water is transparent, it creates some kind of optical illusion making it look white? Yes, and before you ask, 
the pool's depth is two and a half meters before hitting the bottom, as it's for entertainment rather than training. I prefer the training ground you showed me earlier. A Mayurai declined. She's referring to a section of the same training ground where Haku is. There, you can set up the output of lasers, cloud balls, and lightning to practice dodging and striking simultaneously. By the way, I want to return to Kirigakur to get my things, she tells me while I see her glance sideways to gauge my reaction. Sure, we'll go back first thing tomorrow, I have to change my pants due to the stabs she made as a joke, make her the new headband, and examine the state of some medical facilities and capsules that I want to start using soon. It's already noticeable to go shirtless, but if I also go with torn pants, I'll look like a vagabond. A strange vagabond with gold accessories. Aren't you worried that I might leave you at the altar? Amei smiles provocatively again. No, I raise her chin with my index finger to look at her, tilting my head to one side and leaning in until we're inches from each other's faces. You're strong, and I believe my wife deserves that level of trust and more, don't you think? Her response is to try to bite my finger resulting in a small shock that makes her hair stand on end. You and your damn intangibility. I hear her mutter her complaints as she walks away, stomping her foot, with the feeling of punching something, only for it to land on soft cotton. I laughed at her reaction and headed to the island's laboratory. It's divided into several levels, the accessible ones equipped with the most modern facilities, while the ones accessible only to me and authorized personnel have more futuristic and complex machines. The same machine can serve many different purposes if used properly. There are plenty of mechanical arms, cables with glowing fluids on the ceiling, screens on the walls to display data, and what could be confused with Mass Effect's Reaper pods, Baldur's Gate 3's Mind Flayer pods, or DBZ's medical chambers, among other things. Perhaps more like the latter, as it tends to be more mechanical than biological. A mad scientist's dream lab. All I need now is a hunchbacked Igor and a plate of dark chocolate chip cookies. The reason I want to examine the condition of the nutrient capsules is that I plan to do something that even genius researchers like Orochimaru or the second Hokage were unable to see despite how obvious it was. I just need to inherit the three months worth of knowledge to know how to operate these things, but I'll also need DNA samples, tissues, etc. My purpose this time when I go down to the ground is very simple, to bring a sealing master. Once I solve the issue of getting to and from the village, I intend to make a deal with Danzo. Yes. Danzo. He can be a cancer if you're an MC with cheats who appears in Kanaha, but he's one of your best allies if you're a foreigner, as long as you can pay him and avoid falling for his tricks. But let's leave the deal with the guy with a fetish for eyes for now and focus on the Fuinjutsu master. I've thought about it, and I believe the best option is Karin, more specifically, her mother. If I'm still in time, I can save her from dying due to overusing her chakra by endlessly healing the Kyuzagakur ninjas and letting them bite her. What if I'm too late, and Karin has already taken over her mother's role? Hmm, I guess Haku will have a new friend her age to play with. Either way, the point is that I'm sure Karin's mother has the basics of Uzumaki clan seals in her head, which is what I want. It's her second nature, but I think she doesn't use that knowledge out of fear. Otherwise, they would hold her daughter hostage as an early medical kit, keeping her away from her. They would force her to make explosive tags until she dies or something like that. Am I worried that they won't want to come with me? I have several options to make them want to join, and among them is using Kagura's mind's eye to show that I come with good intentions, if her mother has it, or going for the complete annihilation of Kyuzagakur, among other courses of action. If Kyuzagakur disappears, they'll have to move elsewhere, right? It's completely logical and rational. But let's assess the situation before deciding on a plan. Convincing them to join without further ado would be ideal because I would have to make little or no effort from there. By the time I finished superficially examining that everything was in order and knowing where everything was, I left the laboratory, and Haku approached me with a small creature in her hand. Mr. Enel, the cloud foxes found this little one hidden in the fields, and they don't know if it's a pest they should treat or if it's beneficial. I looked at the creature and raised both eyebrows in amazement. I completely forgot about them. How many have you found? About a dozen small ones and some bigger ones. These little ones are something very good, I told Haku as I took the creature from her and placed it in the palm of my hand. Find and gather both Pakara and Amaerai to bring them to the orchard, I'll explain what they're for there. Yes, Mr. Enel, I see how Haku leaves immediately, and I turn my gaze to the Denden Mushi in my hand. It's interesting to note that the microphone resting on its back appears to be metallic, 
but it turns out to be parts of its own body and not modifications, as one might expect. Were they born ready to be used? Well, that saves me a lot of work, I thought cheerfully as he let himself hang onto my shoulder. I will inherit knowledge from Matt and Vegapunk among other things, so modifying a Den Den Mushy to turn it into a living communication tool is easy, but cumbersome. It's better this way, so I only need to make accessories to customize them. Chapter 18, A Mayorai Ringo's Past If the other villages knew about the existence of these little snails, they would go crazy, was Pakura's conclusion after I finished explaining their functioning and how to take care of them. It wasn't very complicated, so it turned into a brief explanation of less than five minutes. This speed in transmitting information is enough to change the outcome of a war. It's normal for them to react this way because this is a world where technological fronts are entirely inconsistent. As long as it's not something that can affect the ninja, there are hardly any significant technological advancements on a civilian level. Not only that, due to the tendency to keep secrets and lack of communication, there are technologies that can be present in one country while absent in another. They don't even have real phones or a simple telegraph. People are content with sending letters because it's what they've always done, and it works for them. Ninjas, on the other hand, are distrustful of this technology and consider using scrolls delivered by messengers more reliable and secure. The technological level equipped for my village is separated by hundreds of years from the rest of the world, so I also have to be careful if I ever bring non-permanent guests here. How far can they function? A Mayorai asked with interest. It depends on the village's location, I replied. These larger ones are used to amplify the range. Right now, they should easily cover the entire Kirigakur area and parts of the coast of the Land of Fire and the Land of Lightning. The coverage can only increase when more of them are born. That's a quarter of the world. Pakura exclaimed in surprise again. If the range was from Kirigakur to one of the nearby islands, it was already an incredible surveillance tool. But if it could cover such a large area, it could be considered an ultimate war resource. Each one can have a snail, to call, just follow the instructions I've given you, I said as I distributed the Den Den Mushi. What followed were several calls from different places on the island to familiarize themselves with their operation. If I were to distribute all the large Den Den Mushies I have now around the world in strategic locations, I could have global coverage in no time. However, I'm not going to do that for one simple reason. There are too many ninjas moving on land, and I'm sure that sooner or later, someone would notice them and try to kill them or study them. It's better for them to stay safe in the village and focus on increasing their population while we maintain the monopoly. The next morning. I went down to the ground with Amaharai after bidding farewell to the duo who were training. I asked her if she had other plans besides picking up her things since I intended to go to Kuzagakur to take a look, and for that, I had to cross the sea and then traverse the entire land of fire from one end to the other, literally. Even traveling in my elemental form, it would take me a while to cover that distance. If she only planned to make a quick stop, I would accompany her and then bring her back to the Sky Island for greater convenience. If she intended to spend a lot of time, I would go on my own and pick her up on the way back. I don't have many things, so it won't take me too long, A Mayorai said as I lowered her from my arms to the ground. I don't want to have to wait once I'm done, so come with me, she demanded while holding my gaze. Will I be allowed into the village? I asked, puzzled. Kirigakur should still be acting under the control of Obito's Mizu cage. My idea was more to wait for her in a nearby place to avoid unnecessary problems. And by unnecessary problems, I mean killing the idiots who try to attack me, because there would surely be some. I'm one of the seven swordsmen of the mist. I have enough prestige to bring an invited person with me if I want, A Mayorai replied, irritated by my doubt, despite understanding the reason why I asked the question. And if anyone has any complaints about my husband, they can stick their opinion up there. I got it, I interrupted her, admitting my mistake and enjoying how quickly I'm occupying an important place in her heart, whether she's aware of it or not. Just let me know if you want me to restrain myself if necessary. A Mayorai considered it for a moment and nodded, although she didn't think it would be necessary. While most of the people in Kirigakur could go and die for all she cared, there were still a few people she would prefer to keep alive. We took the paths that only the ninjas of Kirigakur were familiar with, and it didn't take us long to reach the village. As I expected, people were unable to avoid turning their heads to look at me. This time, perhaps it was more because I was walking beside Amaharai as an equal rather than behind her as a subordinate, which undoubtedly aroused their curiosity. It seems her prestige is higher than I expected. 
I watched as people moved away from her path, their gazes filled with a mix of respect and fear. I looked around with interest as it was the first major village I had visited since coming to this world. Initially, I imagined the place with tall trees and houses built in them, but the reality is quite different. While it's true that Kirigakur has dense forests, the village is situated amidst mountains. The architecture consists of several cylindrical buildings with plantations of trees on their roofs, which I assume are designed for proper rainwater drainage and favoring concealment in nature, given the frequent rains and the humid climate, which facilitates the formation of mist. From the moment I arrived, I could see the Mizukij's building, as it's the largest building located right in the central area of the village. Even the large round plaque with the word water on it was there. To my surprise, a Mayorai's house was not in the best area of the village, as one might expect given her status, but it wasn't in the suburbs either. It was a simple two-story wooden house built near one of the small streams that crossed the village. It was so close that she only needed to take less than ten steps to go fishing if she wished. There were no neighbors in the immediate vicinity, but there were several cut marks, explosions, and craters. One could imagine the amount of training a Mayorai must have done in this place over the years to leave so much chaos around. We didn't enter immediately, and Amayarai stood silently contemplating the place, knowing that once she left, she would probably never return. My father was a pretty good carpenter and built this place shortly before he married my mother, she began to say without taking her eyes off the small house where she grew up. Even after all this time, I still don't understand how he prevented the wood from rotting due to the humidity in the area. I didn't say anything, but I put a hand on her right shoulder to convey support. When someone starts an explanation in a situation like this, it means they're sharing something intimate with the listener. When I was six years old, my mother let me accompany her after insisting a lot when she went to a blacksmith's shop to order some custom tools, which would become my father's birthday gift, a Mayorai placed her left hand over mine on her shoulder and kept it there, appreciating the gesture. When we returned, my mother's face changed when she smelled an iron scent in the air. I didn't know what it was at the time and was confused because my father worked with wood not iron. But I had a bad feeling when I saw my mother's reaction. A Mayorai's words made it clear that what she was going to say next wouldn't be pleasant to hear. My father was kneeling on the floor, dead, and his hands were gone, her hands squeezed mine harder. Years later, I found out that a construction company wanted the secrets of my father's trade and offered him a large sum of money, but he refused because he wanted to start his own business. Feeling a threat to their profits, the result was a contract for an assassination mission, which was executed by a ninja from the same village. I could feel Aime Arai trembling at this point, but I didn't interrupt her. After the funeral, my mother used all her favors and contacts to discover the identity of the killer and managed to avenge my dad, but she had to pay a price, for the first time since she started talking, she turned away from the house and looked at me. My mother had the same disease as me, and the fight she had against the assassin was not easy. In her final moments, she managed to inflict a serious wound and poison my mother before dying, but she refused to use the little money we had left to go to the hospital, tears began to accumulate in the Kunoichi size. Just a week after that, I was left alone and started looking for power frantically. Once I became one of the seven swordsmen of the mist, I went and killed everyone involved in the construction company that issued the mission. A Mayorai approached and hugged me, leaning her head against my abdomen. After completing the goal I pursued all my life, I had nothing left to live for and I only thought about how to die on my own terms with the little time I had left. Dying in a battle against someone strong sounded good in my head. I thought the moment had come when I met you, but here I am, she lifted her head, and I could see tears running down her cheeks as she revealed a vulnerability I never expected from her. You gave me the life I gave up long ago, stole my first kiss, and gave me both a purpose and a new place to call home. You'd better take responsibility. After holding my gaze with her teary eyes for a moment, she jumped and hugged my head, kissing me. Her lips tasted slightly saltier. I returned the kiss firmly and warmly while hugging her. I sat on the ground with my legs crossed to make her more comfortable, and I could feel her insecurity once she had opened her heart so wide to me. Only a clear response could reassure her and make her feel safe in this moment where her emotions were out of control. After the long kiss, we shared several smaller kisses to comfort and encourage her ending with our foreheads resting against each other's while we silently enjoyed this unique moment of unity between us and no one else. I don't know how much time we spent like that, but we heard something fall nearby, and we turned our heads to see a woman with auburn hair staring at us with her mouth wide open and her light green eyes. Chapter 19, House Moving Terumi Mavop
I returned from the mission in the land of rice tired and in a bad mood, as the new Chunin addition assigned to my squad had died. Although I had my doubts about his character when I first met him, I accepted the village's arrangements in silence, and the mission ended successfully, so we decided to take a day off before heading back. It was pleasant compared to the humid and dark climate of Kirigakur, the sun warmed the skin, the air lacked the salty smell of the sea, and the rice fields delighted the eyes with their swaying in the wind. When the team gathered the next day, we noticed his absence, and after investigating the surroundings, we found him in a discreet alley, dead with a happy expression and lipstick marks all over. As the squad leader, it was my duty to investigate what had happened, and the results were quite disappointing. It turns out that while we relaxed and toured the area, the Chunin went out drinking, and after several hours of being drunk, he ended up walking into the red light district. When we inquired about the woman he had been with, we learned that she had disappeared without a trace, so we were only able to determine how he died but not who killed him. I don't care about the death of the 40-year-old Chunin, as it was clear that he had given up on improving himself a long time ago, and there was no potential left for him to go any further. He also violated ninja taboos, so even if he hadn't died, after learning of his behavior, I would have expelled him from the squad and requested a replacement. People like him are a danger to others in this profession. But his embarrassing death will stain my almost perfect record, so I thought of going shopping to relax with the money I earned from the Birank mission. After finishing my shopping, I still felt a bit unsatisfied, so I thought of visiting someone to chat and catch up, which always cheers me up. However, after moving around a few times, I discovered that most of my acquaintances were on missions, which made sense as it was close to rent payment time, and having some extra money on hand was always better. I was about to head home when I heard about Ringo's return to the village and made my way to her house, not thinking too much about the man they said she brought with her. Probably a prisoner who would be sent to the interrogation division for information extraction through torture, it wouldn't be the first time she brought one, and it wouldn't be the last. Ringo lived in a somewhat isolated area, but it wasn't difficult to get there when you knew the way and followed the traces of destruction she never bothered to fix after training. I leaped between the tree branches, and just as I was about to descend, I saw something that left me so shocked I almost fell. Ringo was kissing a man. I immediately felt uncomfortable all over, not only because of the lovey-dovey atmosphere I was witnessing but also due to the sudden revelation that Ringo had managed to get a man before me. It's not that I'm saying my friend isn't attractive, it's just that she has never been too concerned about dressing up and looking more appealing to the opposite sex, as evidenced by her daily attire. I found it quite annoying. She doesn't even know how to use makeup. Every time I tried to set up a girl's day, the look she gave me. But there she was, seemingly enjoying the best moment of her life with a smile as pure as I had ever seen. I'm feeling so envious. But I'm also genuinely happy for her. I was so lost in my own thoughts that before I knew it, I lost my balance and landed on the ground a few meters away from the couple. Now the situation had become awkward. Third person POV. Oh, it's just Terumi, a Mayorai said upon recognizing one of the few people she was close to. Are you jealous? She surprised herself by not feeling embarrassed about catching them in the moment. Instead, she felt unexpectedly at ease and regained her confidence. I never expected you to take the lead, Terumi sighed as she looked at Enel noticing that he wasn't even wearing a shirt. Will you introduce me to your boyfriend? Terumi wanted to make a good impression on her friend's partner after her accidental interruption. This is Enel, my fiancé, a mayor I corrected, putting on a proud expression to show off to her friend. At. Terumi felt her shock multiply by ten when she processed the words. Aren't you moving a bit too fast? She blurted out, unable to contain herself. The couple exchanged glances for a moment before responding with a simultaneous smile. No. Terumi could only accept that love, which had always eluded her friend, had suddenly hit her with great force. Never mind, should I come back later, or... Terumi wasn't sure what course of action to take next. In fact, you've arrived at the perfect time, a Mayorai reluctantly pulled away from Enel's warmth and approached Terumi. I came to pick up my things to move. Would you mind giving me a hand since you're here? Aren't you going to live in your house? Terumi asked, somewhat puzzled. Ringo's house was simple, but it was built for a family to live in, and there was enough space for the two of them to live comfortably. Although I have many memories in this house, I prefer the one Enel has, it's much more spacious and comfortable, A. Mayorai commented. And she was telling the truth, the difference between her small house and Sky Island was enormous. Terumi misinterpreted her friend's words, 
thinking that she was recalling what happened to her father and wanting to leave that part of her life behind. All right, I'll help you pack everything, Terumi took her friend's hands and nodded, feeling that she had to support her in this new phase of her life. The three entered the house and began packing everything a Mayurai wanted to take in boxes, which they then stacked and stored in a ceiling scroll for convenient transportation. By the way, I've never seen the garter on your leg, Terumi asked once she noticed it. Which village were you from before joining Kirigakur? Enel and Amaurai exchanged glances for a moment. It seemed that Terumi had misunderstood and thought something like Enel was the traitor from a village who fell in love with Amaurai and decided to follow her to Kirigakur to be with her, a real love. Chapter 20, Farewell It's normal that you don't know her, it was established just a few days ago, I replied, shrugging as I continued to move things without stopping. I do remember enough about Terumi. It's better not to give her too much time to talk or I'll get caught in a whirlwind of questions and gossip. Really? It's been a while since someone tried to do that, it seems like people don't learn, Terumi shook her head. It was clear that she didn't consider it smart for anyone to try founding a village given the current state of the ninja world. In her opinion, it was best to join an established village that had stood the test of time. Is that everything? I asked Amaurai when I looked around and saw that there didn't seem to be anything else to store even the furniture her father had made was stored in the scroll. Yes, Amaurai looked around at the walls with nostalgia, knowing that once the village realized her desertion, there was a good chance her father's house, built with his own hands, would be demolished. Don't worry, I'll drop by from time to time to clean the place if you ever want to come back and use it as a vacation home or something, Terumi assured while waving her hand. Amaurai looked at her friend with a complicated look, it wasn't an exaggeration to say that Terumi was among her top five most important people in her life. They had grown up together, saved each other's lives on missions, and helped her not feel alone in a village where strength prevailed in status. Without her, it was very possible that she would have become a tool without feelings for the village. She took a deep breath before taking a piece of paper from a box and handing it to Terumi. Is this, the property deed? Terumi recognized the documents after reading the large words. No. Keep them, Amaurai said, raising her hand to stop her friend from returning them. I remember that you've always wanted a more private place than the room you have in your clan. It seems to me that this place meets the requirements. Just make sure to take good care of it, okay? This was the only way Amaurai found to prevent the house from being destroyed in her absence and at the same time, repay the friendship Terumi had given her all these years. You better invite me to the wedding. Terumi didn't insist and stored the documents because she knew that once Ringo made a decision like this, she was too stubborn to change her mind. She might as well accept the house and make sure to always reserve a room for her friend. Count on it. Amaurai laughed heartily, giving Terumi's shoulder a friendly pat, and Enel scratched his cheek with a helpless smile. She had thought of celebrating the wedding on Sky Island once the two of them got more familiar with each other over time and when she could prepare a unique engagement ring. But if they have to invite people like Terumi, then maybe she'll have to reconsider where to hold the ceremony. She couldn't say it's a very realistic genjutsu, nor could she reject the guests once the bride invited them so convincingly. Thank you for supporting Amaurai. I hope you can continue to do so in the future, no matter the circumstances, I said, taking an apple and handing it to the bewildered Terumi. Take this as a token of gratitude, it's a specialty. An apple. Terumi looked puzzled at the fruit in her hand and remembered the symbol on Enel's headband, assuming it made sense that apples were the specialty of her former village if they had gone so far as to use it as their representative symbol. Do you want to stay and spend some time with your friend? I asked as Terumi continued to look at the apple. I can wait for you at the entrance of the house. Amaurai understood without a problem that I was referring to the landing point. No, it's fine, Amaurai shook her head, knowing that if she stayed, it would be difficult to leave and she couldn't stand those kinds of things. Terumi averted her gaze from the apple to look at the couple and raised the corner of her lips a moment later, misinterpreting Ringo's expression. Was she being the third wheel? Well, she couldn't blame them, she had seemingly interrupted a very enjoyable moment before. I should go, actually. I returned from a mission recently and went shopping, so I'm a bit tired. We can meet another day, okay? Without waiting for a response, Terumi left and only after walking a few streets, she descended to the ground and looked back with a defeated expression. Why do all the good men end up with other women? She sighed before returning her attention to the apple she was holding. Well, I haven't eaten anything yet, and apples are healthy, let's give it a shot. 
Have all the apples I ate in the past been rotten or something? She wondered for a moment. Back with Enel and Amaharai. Once Terumi left, I followed my fiancé to another place in the village she wanted to visit before leaving, the cemetery. Compared to the one I saw in Kanaha in the series, the cemetery here was larger and less well kept. Most of the tombstones were deteriorated, and only a few seemed to have been properly maintained. Since the implementation of the blood mist, people have been giving less and less importance to their dead, Amaharai said as she guided me to a corner of the cemetery with familiarity. People now prefer to use the dead as a reason for revenge or an excuse to unleash conflicts. Although I guess I can't complain about it, I did exactly that. We stopped in front of two graves that were relatively better preserved and a bit separated from the cemetery area, with some white flowers around them and green leaves forming a distinctive, clearly artificial patch. These flowers are called creeping snowberry, they were my mother's favorite, Amaharai said as she looked at the graves. They don't need much care because they grow very slowly, and this environment is perfect for their growth. I managed to get a handful of high-quality seeds with some effort and planted them around here years ago, thinking they would like to feel their fragrance. These flowers exist in reality, you can look them up. They're beautiful, I said honestly. I don't know much about flowers except for the most common ones like roses, but I'm aware that there are many that are a delight for both the eyes and the nose. Do you think we could plant one of your apples here? Amaharai asked, turning her head to look at me. I could, but it won't grow, I said, not just because of the unsuitable climate or soil. The absence of seeds was one of the things I requested to prevent someone from trying to plant apple trees behind my back. I have some apple trees on Sky Island, after all, and I want them to maintain their monopoly. Right, they don't have seeds, Amaharai recalled that when she ate the apples, they seemed to have no seeds. In that case, take out and give me an apple. Don't you want to? I asked, thinking she would ask for one for each grave as an offering. Instead of responding, Amaharai took the apple tossed it into the air, and with a swift motion of Kaiba, she split it into two identical halves before leaving them on the ground at the foot of her parents' graves. My parents always liked to share desserts. I put my arm around Amaharai's shoulder, and we stood in front of the graves in respectful silence for an indefinite time before Amaharai took my arm and led me away. Not without first bowing to what would be my future in-laws, promising to make their daughter happy. Chapter 21, Bone Needle Halfway back we came across a solitary figure covered in blood, unexpectedly, it was another one of the mist swordsmen, just like Amaharai. What was his name again? Kushimaru, Amaharai said, casting a displeased look at her colleague. He always seemed to pick on her when she was least irritated, as if his amusement relied on her being constantly annoyed. Well, well, if it isn't little Amaharai, Kushimaru responded, placing particular emphasis on little to mock her, as was his tradition. And who's the long-eared one? Did you finally find a boyfriend? He laughed at his own jest before falling abruptly silent due to the surprise of the response he received. My fiancé, is there a problem? At some point, Kaiba appeared in Amaharai's hands crackling with electricity. Wait, really? Kushimaru fell silent for a few seconds as he processed this unexpected answer. Damn, if I'd known you were into tall guys, I would have made a move years ago. Amaharai was about to attack when she heard that, full of disgust at the insinuation, and the only thing that prevented her from doing so was that someone was faster than her. A thunderbolt the size of a large tree trunk fell from the sky and struck down Kushimaru Kuriareri before he could react and use a substitution technique to save himself. All that remained was Nuiberi, undestroyed but glowing red hot because it discharged the attack into the ground when it struck and stabbed the earth. Amaharai turned to look at me. I'm sorry. I know I should have let you handle it, but I couldn't help but make a move after what he said. I didn't expect you to be jealous, Amaharai raised an amused eyebrow at the discovery. It's a matter of defending my woman's dignity, that's what I said, but I admit I'm a bit jealous. I can accept envious glances, and I'm mature enough to control myself in most situations, but such blatant provocation crosses the line, and the sentence is death. What he said wasn't accidental, he wasn't an immature teenager controlled by hormones and his malice was evident to anyone. Thinking about it now, perhaps I gave him too swift a death. Do you want to keep the needle? I asked, trying to change the subject because I knew that if I allowed Amaharai to pay attention to that, it could end badly for me. Sure, Amaharai rolled her eyes as she took out another scroll and sealed Nuiberi inside. It's a pity I don't have the sword summoning scroll, 
I can only keep Nuiberi sealed inside the scroll so it won't be summoned back. Can't you sever the connection with the scroll in some way? It can be done, but I can't do it myself, she replied as she put away the scroll. It would take a sealing expert to remove the link. It seems I have more reason to try to acquire the Uzumaki duo, I thought. Come on, I highly doubt they won't send anyone to investigate what happened, a mayor I suggested, so we quickly left the scene after making sure there were only ashes left. Is something bothering you? I asked, seeing her thoughtful expression as we moved. It's just that I found it strange that this idiot was covered in blood from head to toe. With expert use of Nuiberi, the amount of blood would never reach those levels. In fact, it's usually the opposite, among the seven, it's the sword that tends to leave the least blood traces. Maybe he faced many people at once. Even if he faced dozens, it would have to be madness for that. A mayor I seemed to realize something and piqued my curiosity. What did you discover? We stopped under an overhang as A mayor I continued speaking while releasing the Kirigakure headband and putting on the Simeigakure one. The direction he came from was where the Kagaya clan settlement is located. There were rumors of a rebellion, and the Mizu cage seemed intent on eliminating the problem at its roots. With the motion of Kaiba, the Kirigakure headband was scratched. Are you saying that this person may have gone there to massacre the Kagaya clan and was returning? I questioned without fully accepting it. Shouldn't they have sent more people? Given the reputation of that clan, I doubt one would be enough to deal with them. Kushimaru never cared about his subordinates, there were probably several squads sent, but most of them died facing the Kagaya clan, and the dying or injured were finished off by him because he would find it too bothersome to bring them back to the village for treatment. Do you want to go take a look? I asked her as I considered other plans in my mind. Let's go. We have some time since Kushimara's death, and you want something from there, right? A mayor I recognized the look her fiancé was using. As I expected, I can't hide anything from you. Spill it. What are you looking for? If it's money or something, I don't think there'll be anything left after the looting, and the technique scrolls are useless to anyone outside the Kagaya clan. I mentioned before that I'm like a doctor, scientist, and researcher all at once, remember? Do you want to get some fresh Kagaya clan corpses for research? A mayor I quickly realized the goal. Let me tell you, if you don't know, members of this clan are sick and deranged, I don't think their bodies have much research value. Don't worry, if I'm right, then we'll leave with two gains, I assured her. Although I'll have to ask you to help me with one of those handy storage scrolls, otherwise, I won't be able to get much. I thought for a second and realized she was right, essentially. I asked for the corpses of those who must have died in the least violent way and therefore left their bodies more intact. The Kagaya clan village was easy to locate once we got close enough, as the fires in the houses were still burning strongly, and the scent of blood carried by the wind was more than noticeable. Give me a moment, I used mantra to try to locate survivors. Kimimaro shouldn't be too far away since his escape from the cage should have happened at the time of the attack. I felt three living people, two of whom were a flickering candle, and no, now there's only one but it would soon go out, it wasn't worth paying attention to. I found him, the response was similar enough to Haku's that it was highly likely it was a child of about the same age. I turned my gaze to Amei and had an idea. How would you feel about having an apprentice like Pakara? Chapter 22, Golden Bones After easily acquiring the corpses due to the large number scattered everywhere, we found Kimimaro lying in the snow a few kilometers from the site. In a way, it gave me deja vu of how I met Haku. Is this the child you mentioned? A mayor I asked as she crouched down to see the unconscious child in the snow, prodding him a bit to see if he was still alive. Doesn't seem like much, must be about five years old, like the Yuki clan child. I can assure you he's talented, I said as I picked up Kimimaro and placed him on my shoulders as if he were a sack of potatoes. In fact, he's so talented in combat that his clan was scared and locked him up in a cell, only releasing him when they went to war against someone. If he's half as talented as you say, it could be entertaining to train him. But can you cure his hereditary illness? I'll only consider it if he's healthy and not afflicted by his clan's madness. I don't want to train a lunatic, A. Mayurai replied, furrowing her brows. Please, doubt offends me, I said, rolling my eyes. I can have him healthy in a day, as for his mentality, well, he was raised as a weapon of war, and perhaps we'll need to work on that aspect a bit but I doubt he's a psychopath if that's what worries you. They had him isolated, after all. All right, I'll give him a chance. 
if he doesn't meet my expectations, I can always finish off the last remnant of the Kagaya clan with my own hands, A mayor I considered it for a moment and agreed. It's a shame there are only two children in our village with this one. If there were one more, we could form a squad to train them together. I think that would be less efficient, I shook my head. It's better if one master teaches one student full-time rather than having to divide their attention among three. They can practice teamwork later. Kakashi's Team 7 is a good example of this. Naruto barely improved under his tutelage, despite knowing his identity, and Sakura made no real progress because most of her focus was on training Suzuki. If Kakashi took it a bit more seriously, Naruto could have shed some bad habits, and Sakura could have improved significantly with the right motivation, but he ignored her most of the time due to her civilian background. Besides, teachers need to be able to teach something useful to their students to avoid repeating the case of Team 8. It's obvious to anyone with two brain cells that Kurane isn't suitable to teach Hinata, Kaiba, or Shino. The only reason she got these clan heirs was because of her relationship with the third Hokage's son, Asuma. I'm not saying she's not a capable Kunoichi, it's just that Asuma doesn't hesitate to use his influence to her advantage. But since her specialty is Genjutsu and no one on her team ever used anything like that in the entire series, it would have been more useful to assign a tracking specialist Jonan as the teacher and give Kurane a squad with talents for illusions. Villages don't have time for proper training, they just need effective replacements to quickly replenish their ranks, A. Mayurai agreed with what Enel said, but the reality was very different. That's why there's a minimum requirement for the number of missions to take the rank advancement exam, to filter out the talents the village will rely on in the future, from the cannon fodder used for the most dangerous tasks. Be that as it may, let's get back to the village quickly. I don't think it will take long for curious onlookers to arrive in the vicinity, and I need to treat the child. I told A. Mayurai. I suppose Orochimaru must be nearby, but I tend to think that his encounter with Kimimaro happened a few days after his escape, rather than on the same day. It's still a bit early to run into the snake, so it's better to leave early to avoid trouble. Back in Simeigakur. I have a nervous tick in my eye. Shortly after our return, Kimimaro regained consciousness, and after looking around with unnatural calmness, the first thing he said when he saw me was. Am I dead? Why do people have such a habit of asking me if they're dead? No. Do they think that just because they wake up on a cloud in the sky and see the tallest person in their lives, the only reasoning in their minds is that they're dead? Okay, for some reason, it didn't make sense in my head, but now I see it. No, but I can remedy that if you want, A. Mayurai replied while laughing at the expression on my face. Pakara, I see you trying to contain your laughter. I'll remember this. You're not dead. Lord Enel saved you, Haku appeared and reasoned with Kimimaro, although the way he's doing it makes me look like some sort of savior, which is odd. So I'm still alive. Kimimaro said it as if it were a bad thing, that's not the maturity or attitude a child his age should have, that's for sure. I leave the place while everyone explains the situation to him, I'm tired of doing it despite the few times I've done it. To not waste time. I head to what would be the engine room and prepare to move the Sky Island after reading the manual on a shelf next to the entrance. The system is quite similar to the golden ship Enel built in the series. I need to sit on a golden throne and place my hands on two different surfaces to discharge the electricity and power the engine. At the same time, thanks to my control over electricity, I can steer the direction without too much trouble due to the different instruments in my field of view. There's even a TV that shows me the landscape below the island in high definition. Maybe it's for better parking, I imagine. Since it's the first time I'm moving the village, I have to stay seated while providing the energy, but this won't necessarily always be the case. The island has custom-made special batteries that I can leave charged in case it's necessary to move the village in my absence or I don't want to spend so much time sitting, but that will have to wait until next time. I don't know how fast the Sky Island can go, but it should take us a few days to reach Kuzagakur. One week later. It was strange passing over Kanaha during the trip, but we finally arrived in Kuzagakur without any issues. I've been trying to cure Kimimaro using the knowledge I gained over the last few days, but not achieving the desired results, I made a golden apple smoothie and poured it into the tank with the nutrient solution where Kimimaro has been floating for the past few days, with nothing but an oxygen mask. This is partly to explore the limits of the effects of the golden apple, wanting to find out if eating it is necessary or if it has other applications. Kimimaro absorbed the smoothie through the pores of his skin, and within a few hours, it looked like someone had thrown a sack of flour into the nutrient solution, so I had to renew it. Examining the now whitish solution, I discovered that it was actually tiny, 
countless bone fragments. It seemed that the root of the disease was Chimimuro's own bones, or maybe they were only in his bone marrow. Either way, his bones were destroyed and expelled from his body, while completely new bones grew inside him. The process seemed painful, but he endured it like a champion. Absurd? Well, I don't think he's going to complain. Chapter 23, Blood Bags Then, who exactly are we looking for? Pakura asked, looking around Kyuzagakura as she used the transformation technique and ate a skewer she bought from a street vendor. News of her death had spread at an unusually fast pace in the ninja world, undoubtedly the work of Raza, and she considered it a good idea to lay low for a while until things settled down. As for why she was accompanying me in my search for the Uzumaki duo, it was quite simple, she had been in Simeigakura for a while and wanted a change of scenery, while Haku also took the opportunity to take a break and play with the cloud foxes. So, after learning that we were going to rescue slash recruit more people for the village, she asked to come along. We're looking for a mother and daughter, both Uzumaki, so they have the characteristic hair color of their clan. I know they must be treated quite poorly, so let's look for a rundown house where they might go when injured, even though it's not a hospital. We'll probably find what we're looking for there, I explained. The village isn't too big, it should be easy to locate, Pakura replied. The red hair of the Uzumaki clan is quite distinctive and eye-catching. How old should the girl be? A little older than Haku and Kimimaro, between six and seven. She also wears glasses. Why the interest? I asked. I think I just saw one of our targets, Pakura said, pointing with her skewer stick to a side alley near a restaurant. There, a young girl in patched clothes with red hair was rummaging through the restaurant's garbage container to retrieve some leftovers in good condition. She carefully packed them in a cracked lunchbox while making sure to pay attention to the kitchen door, ready to run as soon as the doorknob started turning. Yes, that's her. What's the situation? The remaining members of the Uzumaki clan should be treated like walking treasures by any village. How is it possible for the girl to be pushed to this state? Pakura asked. I explained the situation as I remembered it to Pakura, and she filled with righteous indignation. I knew the administration of this place was bad, but I really didn't think they could be so stupid, she shook her head, impressed by the local population's abysmally low intelligence quotient. Do they have medical ninjutsu but are resorting to such convenient methods to deal with a member of the Uzumaki clan? Don't worry, once we get the duo out of here, there's a weapon I want to try, and Kyuzagakura is the perfect place for it, I said. Pakura frowned but, considering all she knew about this village, didn't care about what might happen to its occupants. After all, she grew up in Sunagakura, and looting and collecting anything minimally useful were almost second nature to her from a young age, thanks to the scarcity of resources in her home village. Listen, I said. MMM. You mentioned earlier that you regret the lack of basic technique scrolls and such in the village's library, right? Well, you know we're a new village, and I'm not a ninja so we don't have any heritage or anything useful in that regard in the library. You and Amei are the only sources of information and techniques we have, while we have to acquire or buy the tools you need. Since we're going to take something from them, why not do it big? Pakura suggested with her eyes gleaming excitedly at her sudden idea. I grew up in Sunagakur, looting and collecting anything useful is almost second nature to me from a young age. Plus, I don't think they have the ability to catch me, she said confidently. Even if they did, I told her to just kill them and get more stuff. I didn't care much about this rotten place to the core. Almost half of the darkness in Kanaha wouldn't even matter here. Even if they do, just kill them and get more stuff, I told her, not caring too much about this place. Pakura raised the transformation jutsu and, unlike Amei, chose to move silently, taking advantage of the chaos while smiling as she understood what I meant. Raza really doesn't have the talent to be a father or lead people but he has an immoderate ambition within him. It's just a bad combination. Karin was startled once the explosions began and ran out, probably heading home by instinct. Now is when the wolf follows the lamb, no, that sounds weird. Good thing there's no one around to hear me, Pakura thought as she blinked while following Karin in her elemental form. Ten minutes later. In a small house with barely three rooms, Mariko Uzumaki heard the chaos outside and sighed tiredly as she rubbed her arms full of human bite marks. Unable to find Karen's mother's name, I used the name of the Japanese voice actress instead. If the village was under attack, then she would have too many ninjas to heal, and she didn't know how much longer she could withstand the constant chakra drain on her body. 
she feared that they would start using her daughter after her death, breaking the promise she clung to desperately. She deeply regretted not realizing the trap they set until it was too late to escape. Mom. Karen entered the house, panting and out of breath. Someone suddenly jumped in and started cutting down the village's ninjas with lightning. She explained, miming to try to reflect what she saw. Karen, did you go back to the restaurant today? Mariko asked, feeling a pang of heartache at the sight of what her daughter was holding. She couldn't even feed her little one enough to make her feel full. Instead of reacting as someone her age would, she was forced to mature and take it upon herself to acquire more food in the only ways she could think of. All to save up for medicine and try to heal the cold she told her daughter she had. It was the only way to explain her physical condition to her without exposing her to the brutal truth that she was being used as a blood bag to forcefully revive the village's ninja. They didn't even have any money to save, the village made sure they received only the most essential resources for survival, and often, those delivering it pocketed a portion without bothering to hide it. Chapter 24, Your Ability Does Not Interest Me When she remembered what her daughter had said, she wanted to ask for more details, but there was a sudden intrusion into her home. Hey, woman. We have wounded, it's time to work, a ninja with the Kyuzagakur headband burst in, pushing Karin aside without even looking at her. He brought in a severely wounded man who was bleeding profusely from a large sword cut to his chest, which curiously showed burn marks in some places. Mariko paled just from seeing the wound, not only because she knew how brutally they bit her arm but also because, after forcibly healing so many ninjas, she had an approximate understanding of the chakra cost for injuries of this scale. That large wound alone could drain a third of her chakra just to close it. If they brought in more people with similar or worse conditions later, this would be the day she died. Her body simply wouldn't be able to endure it. How rude. Take a little nap, Mariko, and her daughter heard a third unfamiliar voice. They watched as the two Kyuzagakur ninja tensed their muscles simultaneously, began to tremble, and fell to the ground with blank eyes, revealing the newcomer, the tallest man they had ever seen. Well, I finally found a way to knock them out without turning them into charcoal, the man said cheerfully once he entered the house, crouching to avoid hitting his head on the doorframe. Wow, you're in worse shape than I expected. How long do you have before you kick the bucket? Two weeks. No, perhaps that's too optimistic now that I see you better. Mom. Karin approached the bed where her mother lay and tugged on her sleeve while looking at her, part of her not knowing who this man was and the other wanting to find out what he meant. We don't have anything worth stealing, Mariko said, trying to stay calm while attempting to recall any information about the headband she was seeing. Calling me a thief right off the bat is a bit offensive, but considering your condition, I'll ignore what you said and start over. Hello. I'm Enel, and I came to get you out of here and take you to a better place. You just want a medic kit like those unconscious guys over there, Mariko retorted. I try to stay positive, but you're not making it easy, he replied. Let's do this, do you have the mind's eye of Kagura? Because if you do, you should be able to sense if I'm lying, and we can get to the point without so many deters. I don't know what you're talking about. And we continue with the play, he sighed. I can see you're worried that my interest is in your ability to heal others, right? Let me say this, I couldn't care less about that ability. I have something more effective, more convenient, and tastier. Then why bother rescuing us if you gain nothing? Mariko asked. Oh, I'll gain a lot. Two new residents for my village, the children will have another friend of a similar age to play with, and I'll have someone who knows how to use Fuinjutsu, he said. You can use Fuinjutsu, right? It's like the main reason I came and caused all this commotion. Are you the reason for the commotion? Mariko asked. As for his question about Fuinjutsu. She was an Uzumaki and a survivor of the disaster in the land of Whirlpools, of course, she had a strong command of sealing techniques. But revealing that card in her situation would have been dangerous for her daughter. Technically, the cause of the chaos is my fiancé. It's just that she got a bit more excited than I expected, he explained. Mom. Karin pulled on her mother's sleeve. Not now, dear, Mariko had to try to figure out how much of what he was saying was true. But he hasn't lied any of the times. You can't give him a chance. Karin realized that she might lose her mother and didn't want to see her give up. Mariko stroked Karin's head while looking into her eyes. Did she still have a chance to fight and stand up? She was so tired. More importantly, was there a glimmer of hope that her daughter's future could be better than hers? Perhaps could she give it one last try? All right, 
if you can successfully heal me and promise that we can live well as people in your village, we'll follow you. You say you don't have a school, by chance, I was a teacher at the ninja school in Uzashiagakur before the fall. Great, it's time for the magic trick, he said, approaching them and performing the coin out of the ear trick, except his hands held a golden apple and a regular apple. The golden one is for you, he handed the golden apple to Mariko. While the other one is for the young lady whose name is. My name is Karin, pleased to meet you, she said, performing a small bow. Very polite, it's clear your mother was a teacher, he praised Karin, making her feel both shy and happy, perhaps not remembering the last time someone had been kind to her aside from her mother. What kind of apple is this? Mariko asked as she looked at the strange fruit. This golden apple, he said, pointing to the golden one, is why your ability to heal me is irrelevant. Meanwhile, the one in Karen's hands, he pointed to the one Karin was holding, is one of the tastiest apples in the world. Is this golden apple some kind of elixir? Take a bite, and wait a moment, he turned to send a shock to the ones on the floor, as he felt they were starting to regain consciousness. Well, at least the one who wasn't gravely injured. The other had bled to death a while ago, as revealed by his silent heart, but he didn't say anything to prevent Karin from finding out. And you'll see why the apple is the symbol of my village. Chapter 25, Emergency Operation Mariko was about to take a bite of the strange apple, but suddenly, she felt a sharp pain in her chest. Her body tensed up, making it hard to breathe, and her consciousness began to fade. Mom? Mom? Karin saw her mother suddenly start convulsing and tried to approach, but the tall man in the room stopped her and lifted her up to eye level. I need you to calm down and listen to me your mother is going into cardiac arrest. I'm going to save her, but you'll have to help me, do you understand? Karin was in a panic, but finding a direction to help her mother, she nodded despite trembling. Follow the steps I'm going to tell you while I help your mother, Enel approached Mariko and tore her clothing with his hands, exposing her chest to ensure there were no obstructions when he used his hands as defibrillators. Pick up the golden apple that fell from your mother and turn it into a paste, then dilute that paste in a glass of water, Enel began administering shocks while speaking. Then stay by my side, and when I ask, give me the glass. Let's go. Karin followed the instructions and picked up the golden apple. She quickly mashed it in a bowl with a metal spoon, being careful not to let her tears fall into the mixture, anxious not to accidentally ruin it. Then, she climbed onto a stool, took a wooden glass, filled it with tap water, and poured the crushed apple inside. She stirred it, and when it looked uniform, she approached Enel, staying by his side, holding the glass while looking at her mother. Due to her position and the height difference, she didn't notice how Enel was frowning intensely. How many people did she heal with her ability for her heart to deteriorate this badly? He thought while doing his best to keep Mariko alive, using shocks not only to ensure her heart continued beating at the right rhythm but also to prevent muscle blockage suffocation and negative body reactions. We'll have to take somewhat more drastic measures he muttered to himself as he removed a gold earring from one of his earlobes. Using the metalworking knowledge from his original enel, he heated the metal and reformed it with a few moves to make it look like a long, thin scalpel with a hole from the handle to the tip. The weirdest part was that it had a funnel on the handle. It wasn't elegant, but it was functional enough for his purpose, and its incandescent state sterilized the gold just enough. Get ready to give me the glass, Enel said while holding the strange scalpel in his right hand and patting Mariko's abdomen with his left to locate the target. This might be unpleasant, you might want to close your eyes, he warned. Karin didn't know what he meant, but she was scared enough to follow whatever he said without questioning. She tightly shut her eyes. Puchi. Enel stabbed the scalpel at a specific location and angle with surgical precision while using his thumb to cover the hole in the funnel to prevent blood from getting inside. Once he reached the exact depth, he stopped and removed his thumb. He examined the hole carefully to make sure no blood had entered, then took the glass from Karin and poured the pasty liquid through the funnel into the pierced stomach. Once the glass was empty, he waited a second and then removed the scalpel in one swift motion, even before any blood could start flowing. The effect of the golden apple on the stomach kicked in, healing the stomach's wound, the abrasions from the abrupt surgery, and rapidly restoring Mariko's health. That's it, little one, you can open your eyes and you'll see that your mother is safe, Enel reassured Karin, stroking her head to comfort her. Karin cautiously opened her right eye and saw that her mother had a much more relaxed expression and was breathing evenly. She suddenly felt her legs turn to jelly, and she fell to the floor, unable to move, 
while wiping away her tears. You were a great help, Enel said, patting Karen's head to calm her. I need you to go to where your mother keeps her clothes and bring another shirt for her. I don't think she'll like to see herself like this when she wakes up, and we need to go. M.M. At the moment, Karen was heavily reliant on Enel, so she tried to get up to fetch clothes for her mother. However, her legs simply wouldn't respond to her command. It's okay, stay with her. Just point me in the right direction, Enel lifted Karen and placed her on the bed next to her mother. There, the right-hand wardrobe, Karen pointed. Enel was about to walk there, but the unconscious Kyuzagakur ninja on the floor were starting to regain consciousness again. He decided to put them out of their misery. He couldn't keep stunning people every two minutes, it was quite annoying. From Karen's perspective, it seemed like Enel had knocked out the Kyuzagakur ninjas again, but in reality, he damaged their brains to make them stop breathing without regaining consciousness. Externally, they appeared to be unconscious. Wow, your mother seems to really like purple, Enel said, noticing that 90% of the clothing was purple, while the rest was lavender or grey. Even the underwear wasn't an exception. Perhaps the village was just lazy, giving everyone the same coloured clothing for easy identification. He grabbed the first shirt he could find and closed the wardrobe. What about the bra? Well, he only knew how to remove them from his previous life, and Karin wasn't old enough to understand such things yet, so the shirt would have to do for now. It wasn't that Enel was in doctor mode, where he was indifferent to the patient's body while changing the torn clothing. He just wasn't interested in Mariko as a woman. One of his life rules was never to get romantically involved with someone who had children. Not because he had anything against mothers or children per se, but because he felt personally insulted at the idea of helping raise another man's offspring in those circumstances. Helping a mother like Mariko? Sure, no problem. Helping an orphan like Haku or Kimimaro? He wouldn't refuse that either. But if he dated a mother, he would inevitably think that he was being used as a substitute rather than truly loved. Yes, it was very peculiar and for a very specific situation, but everyone had their own thoughts. The same applied when he saw the opposite situation with a single father. If he remarried, he would think that he was using his new wife as a substitute rather than truly loving her. Thoughts from the character to give him some unique personality quirks and to clarify that mothers are outside his personal romantic interest. However, everyone deserves a second chance at love. Once he made sure Mariko was wearing the shirt properly, he picked up both her and Karin to get them out of the burning village. It seemed that Aime Arai was really excited. How many minutes had she spent inside the house for everything to end up like this? Shaking his head, the three of them disappeared, leaving behind only a few arcs of electricity. Thanks for listening.